Good evening. This is Chairwoman Julie Hen. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, February 8th, 2022. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Mr. Christian Thomas. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The Board of Education is deeply saddened and troubled by this afternoon's shooting outside of Catonsville High School. Any incident of gun violence or other violent acts in or around our schools is unacceptable and jeopardizes the sense of safety and security that school buildings provide for our more than 111,000 students. Our thoughts are with the student who was shot and their friends and family. The board will continue to provide all necessary supports to the school system to ensure they can provide safe and welcoming places of learning. We want to thank the Baltimore County Police Department for their quick response this afternoon and their ongoing partnership with the school system to keep students and staff safe. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held in person and virtually and broadcast online through Microsoft Teams and through BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the February 8th agenda. Dr. Yarborough, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I am unaware of any additions or changes to tonight's agenda. Ms. Pasteur. Thank you, Ms. Hen. I move to add Legislative and Governmental Relations Committee update to the agenda as item R1 after board members' comments and agenda. Second row. Second. It. Thank you, Ms. Pester. Is there a second? Second, Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. May I have a motion to approve the agenda as revised? So moved. Second. Oh, okay. Um, so no motion is needed. Um, the revised agenda is approved. And the agenda, um, yeah, the ad revised agenda is approved. Thank you. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. And seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. The minutes of the closed session and information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that I call on Ms. Anderson. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Hen, Vice Chairwoman Pasture, Deputy Superintendent Yarbarrow, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves, 
certificated appointments. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D4? So move, Thomas. Do I have a second? Second, Offerman. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hem? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Yarbrough. Thank you. Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and members of the board, I'm bringing forward on behalf of Dr. Williams the, the following administrative appointments for your approval. Assistant Principal, Chesapeake High School, Executive Director, Middle and High School's Office of the Chief of Schools, Executive Director, Human Resources Administration and Compliance, Department of Human Resources Operations, and Specialist World Languages, Office of World Languages. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit E1? So, so moved. moved. Second, Thomas. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second, Thomas. Okay. Who, who made the motion? Ms. Rowe? Second by Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Any discussion? Ms. Causey? Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to point out that um, the Public Works recommendations um, had significant number of personnel and positions uh, recommendations for the board and I just wanted to express uh, concern that we are not implementing those um, within the time frame that is recommended by Public Works um, and in um, a time frame to be properly supportive of the mission uh, and supportive of the schools. So uh, I'm just putting that concern in this place um, and I would hope that that can be an agenda item in the future to discuss. Thank you, Mrs. Causey. Any other discussion? No? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Abstain. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Dr. Yarbrough? PowerPoint. All right. Our first candidate this evening is Sarah Ilo. She is going from teacher, consulting teacher in the Department of Staff Relations and Employee Performance Management to Specialist World Languages, Office of World Languages in ESOL. Ms. Ilo has a bachelor's degree in science from Towson University and a master's from Drexel. Previously, she served as consulting teacher for the Department of Staff Relations and Employee Performance Management. Prior to that, she was a Spanish teacher at Perry Hall High School, and she has 10 years of experience in Baltimore County. Congratulations, Ms. Sarah Ilo. Our next candidate is Ms. Holly Coleman from teacher mathematics at Kenwood High School to assistant principal at Chesapeake High School. Ms. Coleman was a former mathematics teacher at Kenwood High School, and she has eight and a half years experience in Baltimore County. Congratulations, Ms. Coleman. Our next candidate is Ms. Bashira James from Director, Office of Employment Dispute Resolution to Executive Director, Human Resources Administration and Compliance, Department of Human Resource Operations. Ms. James previously or currently serves as the director. Her previous experience was with the Cook County State Attorney's Office for 11 years, and she has been in Baltimore County for 8.4 years. Congratulations, Ms. James. And 
And our final appointment of this evening is Ms. Larissa Santos from Principal Dundalk High School to Executive Director, Middle and High Schools, Office of the Chief of Schools. Ms. Santos previously served as Assistant Principal in Dundalk High School and had previous experiences Harford County Public Schools for 15 years, Uvalde Consolidated ISD for five years prior to that. Congratulations, Ms. Santos. Thank you, Dr. Yarbrough. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who register to speak to attend in person. Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers are selected randomly using an electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Of course, if fewer than 10 registrations are received, all who registered will be permitted to speak. However, no speaker substitutions will be allowed. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and the school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask speakers to observe the three minute clock which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the tone or see that time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education Participation by the Public. I now call on our advisory and stakeholder group leaders to speak. Our first speaker is Leslie Weber of the PTA Council of Baltimore County. Good evening. Good evening, Chairperson Hen, Vice Chair Pasteur, and Board of Education members. I'm Leslie Weber, the Secretary of the PTA Council of Baltimore County. Since its inception, PTA Council has partnered with and promoted the outstanding work of the Student Support Network, a nonprofit assisting BCPS students in poverty. In the last five years, the network has grown from a program in Lock Raven High School to 14 schools countywide, and there's a waiting list of schools wishing to join. PTA Council has advocated for years for the community school model, which is now being implemented in 22 BCPS schools. Three of those community schools, Baltimore Highlands, Halstead Academy and Mars Estates are network schools. PTA Council believes student support network fits perfectly into the community school framework, which hinges upon establishing community partnerships and that the network's funding proposal for fiscal year 2023 be supported in the BCPS operating budget. The network supports the whole child and often the child's family by providing necessities, food, clothing, shoes, deodorant, period products, backpacks and the like through rooms of support located in network schools and by raising funds for urgent needs not covered by BCPS resources or federal funding. The network depends upon administrators and staff, including school social workers and counselors to identify student needs and advise network volunteers and staff so those needs can be met as quickly as possible. Why should BCPS consider contributing, contributing to the efforts of the student support network? because the network is a rapid and effective provider of supplies for children who don't have the necessities to succeed in school and whose academic achievement is compromised by severe poverty and food insecurity. The network's agility and flexibility is evidenced by the fact that for 15 months while schools were closed due to the pandemic, the network partnered with Baltimore County government to distribute over $7 million in food, clothing, school supplies, and household items to thousands of students and their families. With over half of our students living in severe poverty, there are dozens of schools that would benefit from network programs. A strong partnership with BCPS 
could solidify existing programs and export the ex support, permit the expansion of the network into more schools in the future. PTA Council urges BCPS to consider the student support network's funding proposal for fiscal year 2023. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bosch Ferron of the Central Area Advisory Council. Good evening. Good evening to all. The Central Area team met on the first Wednesday of this month, and we agreed that each member will take a task or a topic. So all members would be active. We also chose four topics for our March, April, May, and June. And I really like to share them with you because we put our minds in them. The first topic for, for March is about mental illness in age six to 18. It's prevention, treatment, effects, etc. In April, we are going to do an open town hall meeting for the central area parents. So all the parents would come in and share the accolades or complaints together about the school system. We are going to tabulate them and give them to you. In May, our topic would be about discipline, about violence, in the school and around it. In June, we like to talk about either drugs, alcohol, or about the grades. So we chose these topics specifically because of their importance, and I believe they attract quite a bit of parent interest. We hope that the Board of Education would support us in those topics and the school system, of course. I want to take the opportunity to recognize my five active members. Without them, I wouldn't be here. The first one is Miss Leanne Dickens, who has taken the, the task of communication and gathering the email list for our area. I would like to thank her and recognize her also for a sound judgment in our meetings. The second one is Mr. Emmanuel, who is known as Manny Hanson. His work is basically in finance to help the foundation in its mission. And also he helped us a whole lot with the Slack software, which is really our communication in the central area. I really love this software a lot. I think it's very practical. Ms. Elisa Alonso, who is the organizer of our Facebook page. Mr. Nicolino for his effort about languages. And last and most important, our student member, Logan Tao, for his efforts to give us the student information that we need. I see my seconds are done, so I will. Thank you. Thank you. Next is general public comment, and our first speaker is Rena Rhine. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for having me. My name is Rena Rhine. I'm the executive director of the Student Support Network, the one that Leslie Weber just spoke about. Um, uh, our founder is going to speak to you today about poverty within Baltimore County public school system, which I'm sure you've heard a lot about and that it's grown um, over the pandemic. Um, and Ms. Weber spoke about our nonprofit. So tonight I am actually going to speak to you not just as the executive director of the Student Support Network, but I am speaking to you as a mental health professional who has worked with youth and young adults as a social worker for the past 15 years. I'm also speaking to you as a parent of a child within the BCPS public school system, BCPS system. Um, Tonight, I want to speak to you about the Maryland Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which found that 25% of middle school students and 28% of high school students in Maryland are food insecure, so meaning that they don't know where their next meal is coming from, if they're going to have 
dinner before they do homework if they're going to have an after school snack. So we know they're getting fed at school, which is great, but we don't know what's happening on the weekend and on the evenings. And that's something that Student Support Network works to address. Um, you can imagine that food insecurity is more of an issue and happens at a higher rate for our students of color. So that's of particular concern. Um, you can imagine that being in a, food, in a family that has food insecurity has a grave impact on mental health for our kids. Um, in fact, according to the survey I mentioned, in Baltimore County Public Schools, over half of the food insecure middle schoolers had reported seriously considering suicide. So not just a fleeting thought, but actually coming up with a plan. And as a parent, as a mental health professional, as a human being in this community, that is something that I just find completely unacceptable. And so partnering with us and letting us provide food to help that issue among the many other things we provide can help these kids, can help these kids do better, keep them in school, keep their mental health in a better place. And we know mental health has really been affected the past couple years. Uh, this is one thing that we can absolutely control, especially in the last two years when there's a lot we could not control. Uh, so we would welcome working with Baltimore County Public Schools to do this. Um, and just kind of going off my script here, just talking about what happened um, in Catonsville today at the school, something this survey also showed is kids who are food insecure, insecure are more likely to engage in violence at school as well as bring a weapon to school. So this is really addressing a lot of issues by being able to provide kids um, something that addresses their basic needs. Um, we do have a packet that we've, um, it should have been passed out or it will be passed out. We welcome you to look at it. Um, my contact information as well as um, Lori Taylor Mitchell, our founder's contact information is in there. Please feel free to reach out and ask me any questions or provide any comments. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sharon Seroff. Good evening. Good evening. I usually talk about uh, special education, but I'm going to also talk about the importance of certain things that teachers need. Um, teachers need planning time. I know we've heard that a lot this school year. Why do the teachers need planning time? Special education teachers perform assessments during this time. An assessment is a very important item because it provides everyone with necessary information to help a child gain services so that they can access the curriculum. Recently, I've had a lot of situations where assessments have not been done in, within a 90-day timeline as per federal law or who have been rushed Next week is a meeting. I have five days to get that report out. Oops, I forgot to get that information to the parent because I don't have any time to do it. Or another thing that goes on is that teachers aren't able to even read IEPs because they're in the classroom all day, including during their lunch break. How would you like to be in the classroom from 7 o'clock in the morning to 5 o'clock at night? Yes, I'm talking about teachers being in the classroom that long. I get calls sometimes at 6, 7, 8 o'clock at night from teachers concerning my clients. Teachers need planning time. Another thing that I mentioned before central IEP meetings. We no longer have access to that in Baltimore County. Other counties still do. There are two mechanisms now that a parent has if they have a dispute. They go to mediation or they go to due process or they walk away. Parents shouldn't have to walk away 
parents should be able to resolve disputes and not clog the courts in order to do that. We need to have the central IEP put back in the system so that parents have the opportunity to resolve disputes within the schoolhouse and within this county and not have to deal with the court system. Thank you. Our next speaker is Laurie Taylor Mitchell. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Dr. Lori Taylor Mitchell, president of the Student Support Network, a nonprofit organization assisting students in Baltimore County Public Schools. We currently have programs operating in 14 schools and a waiting list of schools wishing to join. As Leslie Weber stated in her testimony, the Student Support Network is proposing a collaborative partnership with BCPS with the goal of providing more assistance to students in great need. This partnership is one of many that could respond to the huge increase in poverty in BCPS. The number of students qualifying for farms or free and reduced price meals has increased by 60% in BCPS over the last 15 years. At Lock Raven High School, my son's former high school and the first school in the network, the percentage of students in poverty increased from 14% in 2006 to 48% of all students by 2021. 59,000 students in our school system now live in severe poverty, over half of all students. And the chronic stress and trauma of this poverty affect the entire system every day. We are asking for the resources to assist more students, like the one who came to school last fall, wearing shoes literally falling off his feet, and school staff had to tell him he could not return to school without other shoes. The network immediately provided shoes for him, and for students who are wearing shoes two sizes too small, for whom we also purchase shoes. For the elementary school children recently walking to school in ragged shoes, socks, and croc sh shoes in the rain and snow. We ask for the students who are hoarding food in their lockers for the evenings and weekends because they know they won't have enough to eat. We are asking for the students experiencing homelessness who have no way or no one to wake them up for school, for whom we supply alarm clocks and bedding if they're sleeping on floors, or bedding for families reestablishing housing. We ask for the hundreds of students visiting rooms of support, the rooms and network partner schools where staff take students to get essential supplies, including soap, shampoo, and period products. We're asking for the students who go to these rooms of, uh, for deodorant because their classmates are complaining that they smell or for socks and underwear. One student depended so much on the room of support in her school that she called it the room of heaven. We ask for students who are regularly bullied in school because they can't afford to get haircuts, which we've also provided, and for those shivering at bus stops without a winter coat. There are thousands of students in our system who do not have the basics they need to succeed in school and in general living. We hope that BCPS will give us the opportunity to show the transformation that could happen with sustained funding for schools with network programs and expansion into new schools to assist students in poverty. The Student Support Network creates opportunities for BCPS administrators and staff to focus on what they do best, providing a quality education for all students in the system, regardless of their economic circumstances. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sonia Moore. Is Ms. Moore with us? No? Okay. Our next speaker is Chantelle Breen. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Chantelle Breen, and I am a highly effective teacher for Baltimore County with 20 years of experience. I wanted to share with you some positive perspectives that I have of the virtual learning program so that you can hear how much the VLP means to the families of the students I instruct every day. I am urging the board to consider this program as an effective means of learning for so many of our students in Baltimore County Public Schools. Unlike remote learning, which was pulled together because of the pandemic, the VLP is a program and the staff members work hard to provide high quality instruction for thousands of students. This includes social emotional support, such as class meetings, lunch bunches, guidance groups, 
after school clubs and a tutoring program. For many teachers like myself, we found a hidden talent during the pandemic. We excelled teaching virtually. Just like many of our families and students discovered, they flourished academically in a virtual environment. Over 50 parents of my sixth grade students responded immediately when they learned that I was speaking tonight. Here are just a few of the many positive comments that I receive from families who want the VLP to continue. My child struggled academically every year due to talking and distractions in class. Once virtual learning started, her grades improved. She even has two advanced classes. Virtual learning has set my child up for success. My son has Asperger's and social anxiety. His function, he functions much better in the virtual classroom where he has greater control over when he interacts with students. VLP has helped my child become an advocate for herself. She is very shy, but has become quite outspoken virtually. She has an IEP and learning online has allowed her to work at her own pace so she doesn't feel overwhelmed. My daughter has flourished in the VLP this year. As a parent, I feel I understand more about what she's learning since I am home and hear her lessons. My son has become very independent and takes charge of his own learning. I hope he is able to continue in the VLP. It has transformed his work ethic. Our children have asthma and a history of pneumonia. The VLP significantly improved their attendance since they have remained healthy. The VLP has been wonderful for both of our children. The structure of the classes and organization have exceeded our expectations. Both of our children are shy and do not like to speak in front of others. Virtual learning has provided them with social improvements and growth when interacting with their peers and teachers. We love having the VLP as an option. We have wanted this for years and appreciate that our tax dollars go to something we want and need. Please continue this very special program. Members of the board, I wanted to be a voice for the many families all over the county who benefit from the VLP. I am confident that given the opportunity, more families would love for their child to attend the virtual learning program in the upcoming school year. Thank you very much for your time and consideration to this program. Thank you. Our final speaker is Bosch Barone. Good evening again. The question in my mind is, there are so many good things about the school system. This picture and that picture is really an example of it. So many good teachers, so many good administrators. So in essence, why do we hear so much complaints either in public sessions or on Facebook, which recently I have been reading? My thought is so many people are leaving because they are really stressed out by the system on the news so many superintendents, both nationwide and in the state of Maryland, are quitting. Teachers are quitting and becoming real estate agents, other professions, because they get tired. And my thought to you is that there was a time the board was completely appointed. I have been here for almost 25 years. And it was boring and it was rubber stamp. When you came in, hybrid board, half and half, it became interesting. It became more productive. There are some frictions. It's okay. That's part of democracy. So my thought to you for consideration is maybe this is time to forget about hybrid board and lobby for all elected board. And each elected official board member would get a stipend much more than what you are getting paid right now. It should be something like 30,000 or so. So basically it compensates for all the good efforts and the long hours you are spending with councils, with schools, etc. It would be money well spent in my opinion. Last but not really least, in my central area, I have 10 volunteers. If you add all the volunteers in all central areas, it would be 40 minus plus. But you only see one come in to the meeting. In essence, you have 39 engines idle, and you have one or two 
or free engines working. This is a missed opportunity. So if a board member is elected, my suggestion to consider that the councils would be under the board member where they seek the advice, consent, direction, and responsibility. I hope you buy into my idea, all right? I want you to know, long time ago, I lobbied for a hybrid board, and somebody took the idea from me and went to an app. Thank you. The next item is the superintendent's report. And for that, I call on Dr. Yarborough. Thank you. Good evening, Board Chair Han, Vice Chair Pastor, and members of the board. I am here on behalf of Dr. Williams, who is currently en route from supporting the students, staff, and families at Catonsville High School. Thank you, Chair Han, for your statement regarding the incident. Dr. Williams asked that I express his sincere appreciation of the support of the board, Team BCPS staff members, Baltimore County Police Department, emergency personnel, and our elected officials as we all stand with the Catonsville High School community led by Principal Ames during this difficult time. I am pleased to present Dr. Williams' report to the board and Team BCPS. The report includes celebrations, operational updates, and evidence of our strategic plan, the COMPASS, our pathway to excellence in action. Team BCPS, next slide please. Team BCPS is pleased to celebrate the contributions African Americans have made and continue to make to American history and culture throughout Black History Month. Across the county, Schools are hearing guest speakers, sharing information during morning announcements, hosting door decorating contests, writing reports, reading biographies, and much more. February is also National Career and Technical Education Month, and several BCPS CTE programs will be featured on our blog. Governor Larry Hogan has issued an official proclamation designating this week as Healthcare Heroes Appreciation Week in Maryland. Please join me in thanking our healthcare professionals for their hard work and dedication. The Association of School Business Officials International has recognized BCPS for excellence in budget presentation with the Meritorious Budget Award for the 2021-2022 budget year. Next slide. This week is National School Counseling Week. Baltimore County Public School staff has earned several honors from the Maryland School Counselor Association this year, including Maryland School Counselor of the Year, High School Counselor of the Year, Elementary School Counselor of the Year, Advocate of the Year, and recognition to one high school team for implementation of a model program. Brian Stewart, School Counseling Chair at Catonsville High School, has been named Maryland School Counselor of the Year. Lori Council of Mays Chapel Elementary School has been named Maryland Elementary School Counselor of the Year. Kimberly Ferguson, BCPS Executive Director of School Climate, has been named Advocate of the Year. And the entire school counseling team of Towson High School, Simon Briggs, Lauren Hanley, Courtney Jacobs, Michelle Petrus, Carly Raley, and Svetlana Wright have been recognized for development and implementation of a recognized American School Counselor Association model program. These individuals will be formally honored at the MSCA's annual recognition gala on Friday, April 11th. Congratulations to these team members of Team BCPS. We are proud to share the snapshot of our school system found on the BCPS website. It clearly shows the rich and dynamic makeup of Team BCPS. We serve students of varied backgrounds and needs across a vast geographical landscape. 
our graduation rate stands at 88.5%, an increase above the previous year in spite of the challenges brought by the pandemic. 2021 graduates amassed more than $185 million in college scholarships. Additionally, Baltimore County Public School staff have been recognized at the state level as Teacher of the Year, Support Professional of the Year, and Assistant Principal of the Year. BCPS has 26 Maryland Blue Ribbon Schools and 23 National Blue Ribbon Schools. 51.5% of high school students have taken a CTE course, representing the highest rate in the state. 11,000 student athletes take part in the high school varsity and junior varsity athletics program, and 3,200 participate in our middle school athletics program. BCPS students represent 138 countries and speak 147 languages. As a system, we have much to be proud of. Next slide. While we ce celebrate who we are and what we have accomplished together, we know that our efforts to heal, rebuild, and recover must be ongoing. We also acknowledge that the needs are significant. As has been widely reported, students across the nation have been negatively impacted by unfinished learning. However, there are some positive signs. As soon as safely possible, we want to build towards normalcy, including traditional activities that students and families have come to enjoy as a part of the school experience. We were pleased to expand spectator cap capacity to 50% at sporting events and are looking forward to end of the year senior activities. This week, we are gathering input from school leaders and working with our vendors to explore options. We, almost, we also must continue to plan for shifting COVID-19 metrics. Using feedback and input from building leaders and our health partners, we are planning now to ensure that members of Team BCPS have the tools that they need for a safe return from spring break. Our goal is to demonstrate our commitment to supporting schools in a responsive, collaborative, and differentiated manner. Updates included in this evening's report will include evidence of these commitments. We are pleased to provide Team BCPS an update on our response to COVID-19. At this time, I invite Ms. Deb Somerville, Director of Health Services, to provide a status report. She will be followed by Ms. Mildred Charlie Green, Chief of Staff, for an update on calendar and virtual inclement weather days. Next slide. Good evening. I think I missed, lost the slide, but maybe it's going. It's, it's there. It's coming. Okay. So the good news is our COVID rates continue to improve. Countywide, our case rate on the dashboard, which displays data for a seven-day period ending on Saturday, is at 131 cases per 100,000 residents. This morning, we were able to see data through Sunday, and the number is down to 121. Although that's really wonderful news, we need to remember that our case rate remains in CDC's highest range. And this rate of 121 is higher than the case rate at any time between September and November, where the case rates ranged between 67 and about 117. We continue to make excellent progress. County rates are dropping about 40 to 50% each week, and we have reason to hope that things will continue to get better and soon. Last week, uh, last week, 79 employees reported being diagnosed with COVID and 12 of those employees were identified through our employee testing program. Cases in employees dropped by 45% from the prior week. Last week, we had 304 students reported with COVID. Four of those students were identified through the student athlete testing program. Cases in students dropped by 36% from the prior week. Cases in elementary age students are not dropping as quickly as cases in other groups. We've seen age disparities before in attack rates. We know that our youngest students have the lowest vaccination rates 
and suspect that that may be part of the difference between elementary and student case rates. With lower case rates come lower quarantines. The total number of employees and students on quarantine last week was under 200. Next slide, please. As we live through and lead learning through the waxing and waning of COVID, it's important that we respond to the current situation while looking to the future. We don't wanna get ahead of ourselves or the data. Case rates are still high, mitigation is still important, and things are looking up. Our current focus for mitigation and support is currently focused on these three areas. Vaccination rates. Vaccination rates in students are not yet at the target of 80%. Overall, 62% of our high school students have received one or more COVID vaccines. Just under 50% of our middle schoolers have been vaccinated and only 31% of our elementary students. Based on data from the most recent COVID wave, experts believe that vaccines provide longer lasting and broader protection from infection, severe disease, hospitalization, and death. Vaccination must be part of our long-term strategy to preserve and protect learning and the health of our students. So we're collaborating with the Baltimore County Department of Health on a vaccination program. The campaign will include information for our parents, outreach to families to answer questions and assist with scheduling appointments, and an increase in school-located vaccine clinics. The campaign will include a large variety of BCPS staff. Staff from Title I, community schools, and world languages are partnering with health staff to get the word out and to help our families access vaccine. The second area is testing. It remains a strategy recommended by CDC. Some updates with regards to our testing program. The increased availability of home tests, thank goodness, has provided us with some excellent options for diagnostic and screening tests. We plan to roll out home tests for students who have COVID symptoms at school. This will reduce school nurse paperwork significantly and increase access to testing for our families. In addition, a supply of home test kits will be distributed to all school-based employees later this month. Employees will be directed to use the tests if they have symptoms, a recent exposure, or have participated in a higher risk activity. And finally, masking, quite the top of the news these days. As you know, BCPS continues to order and distribute high filtration masks for use by students and employees. Maryland continues to have a mask mandate for schools, which is in effect through July 4th. There are three off-ramps for the mask requirement. These off-ramps rely on two metrics, 80% vaccination coverage and COVID rates that are consistently low. At this time, BCPS does not meet either of these off-ramps. We continue though to plan for the time when we do meet the off-ramps and are committed to making this transition, transition based on data, guidance from our health leaders, and we are committed to communicating any planned changes to our mass policy well before adopting the change. In preparation for the day when we meet one or more of these metrics and are able to shift to optional masking, we want to encourage all staff, families to take advantage of this time to prepare. Be sure that you and your children are vaccinated and boosted. Next slide. As you know, BCPS included five inclement weather days in the 2021-2022 school calendar. To date, we have used all five days. Our options to address additional inclement weather days this year include extending the school year beyond the last scheduled day of school, which is now scheduled for June 16th, 2022, modifying the calendar by identifying potential makeup days to be used as student days. MSDE has authorized February 21st, President's Day for this purpose applying for a State Board of Education waiver of the 180-day requirement in accordance with state law. And additionally, new for this year, MSDE has created an alternative pathway that with state approval would allow schools to shift to virtual learning for additional snow days for the remainder of this year. Next slide. 
As part of our efforts to gather input regarding virtual inclement weather days, we sought feedback from a variety of BCPS st stakeholder groups listed on this slide. Preliminary feedback was mixed. However, we heard four clear messages. One, traditional snow days are valued by students, staff, and families. Two, transition to virtual days is not the preferred method of learning for our students and youngest learners. Three, staff, students, and parents do not want the school year to extend beyond Friday, June 17th. And finally, staff, students, and parents are not in favor of reducing spring break. In response to this input, the next slide identifies the BCPS plan should we need additional inclement weather days. Next slide. In order to maintain the option to use virtual inclement weather days, we must apply for MSDE approval. Our plan for additional inclement weather days is as follows. If we have an additional inclement weather day between now and Friday, February the 18th, February 21st, currently the President's Day holiday, will become a regular school day. The last day of school will remain June 16th as scheduled. If we have one inclement weather day after February 21st, 2022, schools will be closed for that day and the school year will be extended by one day. The last day of school will become Friday, June 17th, 2022. If we have two or more inclement weather days after February 21st, 2022, on the first day, schools will be closed and the school year will be extended by one day. Any additional snow days, day two and beyond, would become virtual weather days. The last day of school would be Friday, June 17th, 2022. Under all scenarios, the last day of school would be no later than Friday, June 17th, 2022. Next slide. As stated before, to maintain the option of using virtual weather days if necessary, we must apply for state approval. A January weekly transmittal to superintendents contained information regarding the repurposing of future inclement weather days as virtual learning days for the remainder of the 21-22 school year. Given the inclement weather that Maryland has experienced thus far this winter and in anticipation of additional days, the state has opened a pathway to repurpose inclement weather days as virtual school days. To ensure meaningful and equitable virtual instruction during inclement days and to ensure that virtual instruction does not adversely impact student learning, key components must be included. Requirements of the state plan include devices and access to Wi-Fi, accommodations, a communication process, and attestations. Next slide. Thank you. As part of the application process, MSDE requires school systems to ensure that all students and teachers have the necessary devices and access to Wi-Fi for virtual inclement weather days. BCPS currently maintains a one-to-one -one device ratio pre-kindergarten through 12th grade. The Department of Information Technology will continue to implement remote tech support to provide timely support to students. Additionally, Throughout the pandemic and continuing into the 21-22 school year, BCPS has provided wireless hotspots to all requesting families to ensure access to internet from home. To date, BCPS has more than 3,000 student deployed hotspots. Next slide, please. To gain MSDE approval, school systems must be able to implement a student's current IEP during the virtual inclement weather day. This includes specially designed instruction, related services, supplementary aids and services, and accommodations. Under our proposed plan, 
BCPS will offer the full continuum of educational services in a variety of alternative delivery models to meet the needs of students. Special education supports and services will be provided within virtual classrooms, small groups, and individualized settings to ensure IEP goals relating to core instruction are supported and time with general education peers is realized. A free appropriate public education will continue to be provided when a school is temporarily placed on virtual instruction with an IEP being implemented as written to the maximum extent possible following the IEP planning for emergency condition sections of the IEP. Students may receive academic, behavioral, functional living instruction and intervention, strategy uh, and intervention strategies in small group and in individual settings. BCPS will provide related services such as speech, occupational and physical therapy, vision and social work also through individual and small group virtual sessions. Child find screening and evaluations for students age three to five will be available and conducted virtually as appropriate and evaluations conducted by occupational therapists, physical therapists, speech language pathologists and other related service providers may be conducted virtually as appropriate. So under MSDE guidelines, school systems must describe the communication process they would put in place to inform students, teachers, parents, and guardians of the implementation of inclement, virtual inclement weather days. We must also share the plan for instruction. In the event of forecasted inclement weather, Baltimore County Public Schools would include information regarding a synchronous virtual instruction day as part of the system communication that is sent to families via email, social media, telephone, and website emergency alert. Schools would operate on a two hour delay schedule to meet synchronous learning requirements and allow teachers an opportunity to adjust lessons for virtual instruction. Staff and students will be reminded to take devices and chargers home in preparation for virtual instruction. And this if this proposed plan is approved, BCPS will send a communication to all stakeholders to inform them of the virtual inclement weather day plans for the remainder of the 21-22 school year, including detailed guidance for implementation. Next slide, please. Finally, MSDE requires school systems to attest to the following. One, that there will be a minimum of four hours of synchronous instruction for all students each virtual inclement weather day. Two, attendance will be taken for all students and teachers during the virtual inclement weather day. Three, there will be opportunities for students to make up work missed during the virtual inclement weather day. Next, the virtual inclement weather day plan will be posted on the local school system website and a link will be provided to MSDE upon approval of the virtual inclement weather day plan by MSDE. And finally, the virtual inclement weather day plan must be presented at a publicly accessible local school system board meeting. Next slide, please. This slide identifies our next steps. We will immediately submit our plan to MSDE for approval. If approved, we will communicate the plan to Team BCPS. Communication will include overall components of the plan, rationale, and easily accessible resources for the community in preparation for implementation. As has been stated earlier, we must apply in order to have the possibility or to maintain the possibility of implementing virtual inclement weather days at some point in the future. At this time, I turn, it, I turn to Deputy Superintendent Yarborough. Thank you. We will continue to update the board, our community, and Team BCPS during these changing times. Our partnership remains critical to assuring a safe and successful year for all of our students. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda. Yes, Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just had a question for Dr. Yarborough. So the plan is to um, apply to MSDE, and then is there, um, is that the recommendation that's being brought forward for the board's approval, or is this just a point of information? 
Thank you for that question, Ms. Kazi. Um, this was presented as a point of information. MSDE's process requires in the attestation that the plan be presented at a board meeting and that the plan be submitted to them for approval. Thank you. And is this an opportunity where we can ask additional questions? It's, it's a point of information. So if you'd like to discuss it further, we can consider it as a future agenda item and we will be taking those at the end of the meeting. Okay, if we email questions, can they be put in a weekly update for all board members and possibly sure. the public talking points? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thomas? Uh, I don't believe this is the appropriate time for me to address my concern. Okay, thank you. The next item on the agenda is the chair's report. I'd just like to briefly share that my heart, thoughts, and prayers are with the student who was shot outside of Catonsville High School today and with the entire Catonsville community. As is the board, you remain in my, my heart, thoughts, and prayers. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the student board member's report, and for that I call on Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Chair Hen. Uh, good evening, everyone. I also want to start by um, sending my heart out to everyone in the Catonsville community. Uh, students, I am here for you, and I encourage you to reach out to me, any board members, your counseling staff, anyone in your school building uh, for support at this time. Um, so I just wanted to send my heart out before I, I start with my report. Thank you. Um, the past few weeks have been filled with excitement. Um, I want to start off by congratulating Roa Hassan and Masafar for making it to the final stage of the SMOB election process, candidacy. Over the past few weeks, the Baltimore County Student Council has reviewed applications, interviewed the applicants, and has selected both Masa from Towson High School and Roa from Perry Hall High School to move forward. Every secondary student from grades 6 through 12 will have the opportunity to vote for the next SMOB on March 17th. So students, be sure to check out their campaign pages on the BCPS website and social media accounts uh, to learn more. Speeches are being recorded this Thursday and they will be dispersed in ELA classes and there will be English language arts curriculum available to all students. Last week, I joined our Director of Transportation, Dr. Grimm, to visit two of our bus lots in the school system to learn more about transportation. They were Hopkins Creek and the Kenwood lot. There, I met our incredibly dedicated bus drivers and routing assistant staff who, without a doubt, deserve more recognition than they currently have. But I also saw just how outdated our transportation system currently is. Not the buses themselves, they're in perfect condition, but the technology that is in them from outdated hard drives for cameras that need to be physically removed from a bus to even be accessed to, to inefficient methods of communication by which the current technology requires an operator over, overburdened by call after call as they track buses and sometimes even have to get out onto the buses because of our transportation issues. All of which this board has failed to address. So I ask you, what will this board do now with this crisis? You know, we already chose to deny our school system an opportunity to have an updated fleet with GPS technology, cameras, and navigation that would have costed us zero dollars and zero cents because of ill-informed ideas. Do we plan to amend our budget to put these necessities in there? Because you all know that our transportation system is in crisis. We know that our system needs to prioritize transportation. Yet, when we had the opportunity to do this at no cost, we failed or at least the majority of us failed. Lastly, one of the most incredible experiences I recently had was at Bear Creek Elementary School, where I had the opportunity to serve as an additional assault assistant, help, adult assistant helping within the CALS program. This was an intense task as an, as an additional adult assistant helping within the CALS program. Um, I was helping students all over the autism spectrum, like my little brother and it truly made me feel for our adult assistants, appreciate them, and appreciate how they tirelessly, sh tirelessly show up to help the students in our system, tirelessly advocate for them, calling them their best friends, and shouting with joy as they make progress in the hallways. There was a student who is nonverbal, who talked to another student in the hallway, and they, they were just so overjoyed and crying in the room with me. But they're still making minimum wage, and they dedicate themselves every single day to the role. Board members, we have work to do. We have work to do for our students all across the system, and I think we can get up to the task. Thank you. 
Thank you. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session. Uh, Mr. Bersades, is there any action to be considered? Good evening, Ms. Hen. Nothing to report from closed session. Okay, sir. The next item on the agenda is contract awards, and for that I call on Ms. Joes, Chair of the Building and Contracts Committee. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Uh, members of the board, the, the board's Building and Contract Committee met Friday, uh, I'm sorry, Monday, February 7, 2022. For the record, I would like to report to the full board, starting um, that the, the committee meeting started with Deer Park Elementary School preliminary design presentation, followed by contract awards, where we only had three board members present. Um, at 547, Mr. Kuhn informed he had a hard stop, so we no longer had a quorum of the committee, and we had to adjourn the committee meeting. Therefore, all 38 contracts are coming to the board without any recommendation. However, in the interest of time, since the committee has reviewed contracts K1 through K14 and contracts K15 through K38 are capital projects that can be grouped together, I move that the board approve contracts K1 through K14 that have been reviewed and discussed in committee. Thank you. Point so of clarification. There's a motion to approve. We have a motion on the floor. Mr. Thomas? I was, Is this regarding the motion? Yes. Go ahead. So you said, sorry, K1 through K what number? 14. Four, was it 14? Yeah, okay. It was 14. Thank you. You can address it to the chair. Thank you. Ms. So Hannah, I second that. Thank you, Mr. McMillian, um, for the second. Is there any discussion, board members, on the motion on the floor? Dr. Hager? I have questions about 1 and 11. Can they go okay. Now? Would you like to um, separate those, or Could do you um, want to ask your questions about? Whatever Ms. Joseph prefers. Those specifically. They're pretty straightforward questions. Ms. Whatever Hen? you want. Okay. You, you can ask it during the Do you require, do you need staff to answer those? Um, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> um, Mr. Saris and Mr. Dixit, are you both available? You need they might. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Okay. Madam Chair, I would ask that we. Ms. Causey, I'll, I'll acknowledge you and give, give you the floor. Dr. Would you Hager? like me to ask questions or do you want to? Sure. Go ahead, Dr. Hager. Um, so, um, so, good evening. Um, the contract number one is for the um, uh, hybrid, blended, and online student courses. Um, are these courses, is this new to the pandemic or is this something that we've offered in the past? This is an ongoing program uh, and this is a state MSD contract that we've used uh, for many years. For many years. I was trying to find the his, like historical aspect of it in the, in the um, information and I was having trouble finding that. So this has nothing to do with any of our um, changes we've made due to the pandemic. No, we've had an online course offering uh, since at least 2014 that I know of. Okay, so it's just an extension of that. Oh. Thank you. And then uh, for number 11, which is uh, with the removable trailers, um, re relocatable classrooms rather, um, the, given that we're you know, investing in a lot of new capital construction, is, is we are purchasing these relocatable classrooms, correct? Not leasing them? So, as part of our regular program, we purchase and lease both. Okay. But this request is for a change order for a little over $3 million, uh, and that will be for purchase of relocatables. And they'll be used at Dundalk High School mm -hmm. while the addition is being built. Okay. And the reason we chose to purchase them so, so that they can be used in future so for they any of the capital, for, so it is more cost effective to do that. As we engage in capital construction, they can be moved to other sites. Is that that's the true? Concept? Okay, those are so that's it. Thank you. Thank you. I have a related question to Dr. Hager's as a follow up, and then I'll go to Mrs. Causey. Um, good evening, Mr. Dixit. Good evening. Do we qualify for the state um, for funding through the state for the relocatables on this contract? I understand there's a special um, fund available specifically for relocatables through the state, do you know? So in this case, this is part of the capital program and it is funded by the county, but the total capital project 
for the Dundalk edition, that's partially funded by state and partially county. So it's all mixed in there. Uh, more than likely, these are all county funds. And we are grateful to them that they had agreed to allow us to purchase that. Okay. Thank you. Mrs. Causey? Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I will need to separate out. Um, are your questions um, on 1 through 14? Mm, yes, some of them are. Do you want to accept? Okay. So I have them and they just, just escape. Um, if someone else had questions, you can go to them while I pull this up. Board members, any other questions or discussion on 1 through 14? I got those numbers right. Hearing none, we thank have a motion you. on the floor. Okay, thank you. I have it now. So for the uh, contract with the uh, online learning that Dr. Hager um, commented. Which number, Mrs. Palsy? Number one. Number one. Okay. Um, there was a discussion in um, curriculum committee about that, and I had asked for follow-up on the per-pupil cost of those programs, and I do appreciate staff did provide input as to um, which schools were using which programs, um, but they did not include the number of students nor breakdown for the per pupil cost. So I think that that would be helpful. Um, we are trying to, especially in the operating budget time frame, uh, really evaluate how we can support our students moving forward. So is that something that the um, board can receive? Yeah. So the, the per pupil cost for per course was included in the response to the board questions. Um, so for example, Apex Learning is $600 per course. Um, and these are MVLO courses. Florida Virtual is nine nine hundred fifty per course, et cetera. And then it was broken down by SPBL vendors as well. So when you say when it was said per course, that's that is the per pupil cost. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, that was not as clear. Um, and then uh, regarding the uh, relocatables. Um, I attended the Building and Contracts Committee meeting uh, virtually yesterday, and I had asked questions about the number of trailers and the age and where they're distributed. Was that information that, um, <laughs> at, if not available today, mm -hmm. could be available to the board? So I'll, I'll, I'll give you some information that I think will be helpful to you. There are 281 relocatable units, and they they consist of 310 classrooms because some of them are double, some of them are single. And the age of unit is anywhere, you know, uh, there are 121 units, uh, zero to nine years. There are 10 to nine, 19 years is 43 units. And then there are some that are more than 30 years. And you had asked about the age uh, uh, average age or, or the lifespan of a relocatable. And what we have received is that average life is 15 to 20 years, but the condition is not necessarily a, a function of age. It is function of usage. So for example, uh, relocatables in elementary schools tend to be in better condition and last longer as compared to relocatables in high school and middle school. So, but all relocatables are safe and we get money every year to repair for repairs as needed. Okay, thank you. Um, and it's interesting because one of the survey things was saying that the um, school house employees really um, dislike the, the relocatables in terms of how they support the students. Um, and how much exactly is going to the Dundalk High School um, project for that relocation? So we have received group? two bids, and the lowest bid is $2.6 million. And they'll be used for projects in future also. So if you do an economic analysis, it comes out that the cost is a lot cheaper as compared to leasing or any other form. Okay, so yesterday it was indicated 
Dundalks would be higher than that. So what is the additional $2 million in the modification for? So the additional amount is needed for other relocatables. They'll be uh, sent to different schools depending on the uh, enrollment fluctuation. Thank you. And that's time, Mrs. Causey. Does anyone, Thank you. any other board members have questions? Yes, Ms. Scott. Yes, just wanted to get clarification. Um, it sounds like, and I just want to understand, so we're, um, it's a, a motion from the chair of the Building and Contracts Committee to approve contracts one through 14, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, but none of these contracts come recommended to the full board, all uh, 38 of them, because, um, did I understand you correct, Ms. Jost, you said there was not a quorum? Correct. Okay, so as I see it, we have five members who are on building and contracts, and am I correct that only two were in attendance at building and contracts? There were three, but Mr. Kuhn had to leave at 547, so at that point it was just Mr. McMillian and me, so we couldn't vote on those items that were already reviewed. So the 38 contracts now, are we expected as a board now to do the work of committee now in the full assembly? Is that what we're expected to do? And I guess I'm directing it to you, Ms. Han. I'm not going to entertain this discussion. We can discuss this outside of this meeting. We have. Well, no, I'm, I'm just curious because we have well, committees we have and contracts. we're supposed. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I understand that. So that's a discussion for outside of this forum. We have 38 contracts to approve. So we there have. To, a, so we're doing the work of the committee now in the full assembly. There so there's a motion on the floor. There is, but I, my comment, my question is in regards to that motion. Yes, I have, I have a question in regards to the motion to approve the. 14, that basically influences um, my um, decision, and that's why I'm just asking for clarification, because I'm just wondering now, so we're approving, the motion is to approve the 14, and then... And then we will consider the others. So we're doing the work of the committee now in the full assembly. All right, thank you. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. So I know the vote wasn't taken, but was there consensus on these contracts in the committee? Ms. Jones, would you like to respond? Uh, no, because Mr. M uh, Kuhn had to leave abruptly, so we never, we never got around okay. to it. Had I known in advance he had a hard stop, I would have brought in the motion prior to that. Ms. Rowe. Okay. Oh, I had another question. So are 1 through 14 coming with a recommendation or without? All are coming without recommendation. Okay, thank you. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. So for the sixth contract, interactive display panels, um, for instructional spaces. I'm excited about this because we talked about this in depth in the curriculum committee. Um, so my understanding is that the $2.7 million would go into this budget for this year and the rest of it would accrue over the next six years, possibly? Yes, yeah, so the proposed budget for next fiscal year, mm -hmm. FY23, next, yeah. includes that uh, annual lease payment of $2.6 million and it would uh, be over a six year period. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hager? I I'm, I'm just also would love some clarification. They were, these were all presented and discussed. There was just not a vote within committee, is, is that correct? No, that's not correct. Okay. I stated earlier, we were presented contracts K1 through K14, okay. uh, and then we had to adjourn the meeting since we no longer had a quorum. Uh, the remaining contracts, however, are capital projects, and Mr. Dixit will be kind enough to group them together in the interest of time and being efficient. Uh, so those should hopefully pass through. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So there is a motion on the floor. It has a second. Ms. Cozzi, I believe your time is up. I have a separate issue. Typically, Your, your time is up on this discussion item, so. I have a point of inquiry. Your time is up on this item. Um, no, I have a point of inquiry. Uh, no, ma'am. Is there any other discussion on this item? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Is this for K1 through K14? K1 through K14. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Madam Chair, I just need to record a recuse for item 14. Okay, so noted. 
Mrs. Pauzy recuses herself on K14. Ms. Dos, would you like to um, make a motion for the remaining contracts? Or do you want I, I do want to ask you, those? right, Ms. Uh, Han, would you like the board to hear through the presentation since the committee never did the work? Thank you, yes. Mr. Dixit, would you like to present? So where are we? I missed the conversation. So which item, which contract we are on? K-15, so if you could group the capital projects. Okay. Thank you present. very much. Um, so items 15 through 24 uh, are for a board approved project, which is Red House Run Elementary School. Uh, I, would, I have summarized those projects in the interest of time. And if you want to talk about any particular project, any package, I'll be more than glad to talk about that. The contract number is JBO 712-21. There are package 1B for testing and inspection, package 2A for demolition and ab abatement, package 3A for concrete, package 4A for masonry, package 5A for steel, package 8A for aluminum storefront and glazing, package 11A for food service uh, equipment, package 23A for plumbing, HVAC, and fire suppression, package 26A for electrical, and package 32A for site work and landscaping. Uh, these packages, they were, most of them are multiple bidders. There, uh, there are four contracts with one bid, which is demolition and abatement, concrete, uh, masonry, and uh, SA Halleck Ironwork for Steel. All of the others have anywhere from two to five bidders. Um, the demolition contract will come in October, later on. Package 1A, general trades, 9A, drywall, and 7A, roofing, is still being processed in purchasing, and it'll come back to in one of the future meetings. And hopefully next time we'll take care of it in building committee meeting so that we don't have to go over item by item. But if not, if not I'll be more than glad to present it here. And then there is another one uh, for painting, which is being processed in the purchasing. So these are all packages, uh, and we are requesting your approval. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Do I have a motion to approve items K-15 through K-24? So moved. moved. Rowe. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Do I have a second? Second. Second, Opperman. Thank you, Ms. Joes. I believe I heard for the second. Um, any discussion? Mr. Kuhn? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dixit, for the insight. Um, I'm going to focus on the items where we only received one bid because that's concerning to me. And I was hoping you could provide us with some insight because as I review this, it says vendors issued to 131 and number of bids on several of these packages are one, two, or three. Um, my guess is, and I'm hopeful that you can clarify this, that the vendors include any and all of the trades and items that we're talking about, um, but maybe, for instance, for 5A, which is steel, maybe there are two or three. Uh, could you talk to that item for us? Um, you don't have to talk specifically to steel, but I think concrete, masonry, and steel are all the same. So I'll give you the technical piece, and then maybe uh, Mr. Saris can help me with the procurement process piece. So. Number of bidders always is a function of market conditions. So if there is more work in the market, uh, there is a tendency for bidders uh, to be selective and only bid on contracts where they, max they can maximize profit. Uh, why they did not choose, but when we go to the next package, you will see that for the same trade, there are more than one bidder. So the only thing that I can say from the technical and economic standpoint, there is a function of how much work is out in the market for the available labor. And with that, George, if you can add anything on the process part. Yes, the only thing that I note is that uh, 
We did not receive any no bids in these contracts, and that's when a vendor will provide us with information on why they were unable uh, to participate or chose not to participate. Um, and I don't have that information for these. Um, and so I would agree with uh, Mr. Dixit that um, it's a, a market uh, circumstance. And, and just to clarify, it says 131 vendors issued to, but that's not 131 steel providing companies. Is that correct? Well, that means that 131 uh, contractors, whether they be steel or general or otherwise, uh, uh, went online and, and uh, looked at the bid packages. Okay, I, that's really the clarification I'm looking for because yeah. when I read this, it makes me feel like we sent these or provided these bids out to all these companies that do this work, but that's not ac actually the case because if I'm in the concrete business, I'm not going to bid on steel. Do you, do you see what I'm, right. I'm getting at? Right. All right, so that's, that's really what I'm trying to understand. That's, that's really all my question was about. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion, board members? No? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Mr. Dixit, would you um, please present K-26 through K-38? So these items 25 through 38 are for replacement of Summit Park Elementary School, a project that has been approved by the board uh, under the Capital Improvement Program. Again, I have summarized the list in the interest of time. Package 1A for general trades, two bidders. Package 1B for testing and inspection, four bidders. Package 2A, site work, two bidders. Package 3A, concrete, three bidders. Package 4A, masonry, two bidders. Package 5A, steel, two bidders. Package 7A, roofing, two bidders. Package 8A, uh, opening package is two bidders. Package 9A for drywall and acoustic is three bidders. Package 9B for flooring, one bidder. Package 9C for painting, one bidder. Package 11A for food service equipment is three bidders. Package 15A for mechanical plumbing and fire suppression is one bidder. And package 16A for electrical is one bidder. So these are the bidders and uh, we are requesting your approval. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve items K-25 through K-38? So moved, Ms. Pastor. Thank you, Ms. Pasture. Is there a second? Second, Offerman. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen. Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the work session on the superintendent's proposed FY 2023 budget. And for that, I call on Dr. Williams and Mr. Saris. Good evening, Chairwoman Hen, Vice Chair Pastor, 
Dr. Williams, and member of the Board of Education. I'm pleased to open the fiscal year 2023 operating budget second work session this evening. The fiscal year 2023 pro <laughs> proposed budget is closely aligned to the BCPS strategic plan, the compass, our pathway to excellence. Significant proposals are geared towards our goal of raising the bar, closing gaps, and preparing for our future. Next slide, please. The proposed budget focuses on two key areas for our school system, people and progress. It is centered on our core purpose of increasing achievement for all students in a variety of pathways to prepare students for college and career. Next slide, please. The district-wide budget development process is a collaborative one involving the input of many stakeholders, including principals, departments and offices, employee unions, parent advisory groups, executive staff, the Office of Budget and Reporting, the superintendent, and the school board. The budget reflects the labor, materials, and resources required to fulfill the goals and objectives of BCPS as outlined in our strategic plan. This is an operational plan stated in financial terms for carrying out the mission of Baltimore County Public Schools. The budget preparation process begins each year in September and continues through May for formal adoption. Next slide, please. The timeline for the FY23 proposed budget is pictured on the slide. Today, we are in budget work session two in preparation for the Board of Education vote on February the 22nd. Next slide, please. This evening's work session will focus on budget requests related to curriculum and instruction and business services, including facilities, information technology, and transportation. Next slide, please. Following each section, there will be a related question and answer period. There will be one Q&A related to curriculum and instruction and a second portion for business services. The resources listed on this slide were provided to guide this evening's conversation. The FY23 budget book is available on the website for members of the community. Members of the board have been provided with a hard copy. Additional materials provided to the board are the FY23 workbook, a condensed version of the full budget book, and an addendum which provides an overview of the organizational structure and an update on staffing related to efficiency report recommendations. To facilitate efficient responses from staff this evening, board members are asked to please identify the sources referenced when posing questions. Division staff are here and available to answer questions during the two Q&A segments. At this time, I turn it over to Mr. Saris and Mr. Tantliff to review the remaining slides. Next slide, please. Thank you. The general fund budget, which contains the majority of day-to-day -day spending for schools and offices, including most salaries, is proposed at $1.86 million for FY 2023, which is $178.4 million above FY 2022 and 20.9% above required local maintenance of effort. Next slide. The BCPS FY23 proposed budget for all funds, including the general fund, special revenue, which is the grant fund, Capital Projects, Debt Service, and Enterprise Food Service Fund totals $2.43 billion, which is an increase of $115 million versus FY 2022. Next slide. Here you can see a summary of all the initiatives in the proposed budget. The grand total of new initiatives includes 381.3 positions and $172.4 million. Next slide. To accelerate learning associated with pandemic-driven learning loss, Dr. Williams is proposing a variety of targeted initiatives under learning accountability and results. Next slide. Under curriculum instruction, uh, the proposal includes special ed programs of 135.5 FTEs and $6.4 million, um, non-public placement at $2 million 
$30,000. Elementary school IEP chairs, 75 FTEs and $6.4 million. Magnet programs consisting of 8.5 FTEs and $1.5 million. English learner programs of 44 FTEs, $2.7 million. And a blueprint for Maryland's uh, future transfer to the special revenue fund of 24 FTEs and $1.8 million. That's simply a move from the general fund to the special revenue fund. Next slide, please. Uh, we'll now entertain any questions on curriculum and instruction. I'm going to ask the staff related to CNI to come to the table. Thank you. Slide down. Okay. That will open it up to Deputy. questions. Board members, Mr. Kuhn. Could we go back? <clears throat> excuse me. Could we go back one slide? Um, I can't. So, Mr. Tantliff, my question has to do with the transfer. Just so, you, could you just explain what's happening there? Sure. Um, when the blueprint first came uh, into law several years ago. Um, We've had everything in the general fund because it was unknown what was restricted, what type of recording was required, et cetera. But over time, uh, we found that certain, um, uh, f certain grants within the blueprint are actually uh, act just like a restricted grant. We need to report just like a restricted grant. Uh, we can carry over funds between years like a restricted grant, so we can't keep them in the general fund anymore. It doesn't make any sense. So. Um, last year, we moved the Concentration of Poverty Grant over, and this year, this year being FY23, we're moving the Transitional Supplemental Instruction Grant, which is um, uh, math specialists and reading specialists uh, at the elementary K through two level. Uh, we're proposing to move that to special revenue next year. But it, it doesn't impact what they're doing at all. It'll be invisible to the teacher. It's just what, how we're tracking them. Ms. Mack? Yes, thank you, Ms. Hen. Um, I have asked this question in curriculum. I raised this question when I spoke to Dr. Williams and Mr. Saris, but many of our educators remain untrained on products um, that, were pr that are proven to have a positive impact on academic outcomes. A number of them were purchased prior to 2021 in 2021 alone, we purchased 10 new products to improve reading scores. Um, where in the budget specifically is the funding allocated for the training base, the training database that will allow educators to take and complete training on evidence-based products and other professional development because teachers continue to report to me that they have not had an opportunity to be trained on these very important products. So the uh, Department of Organizational Effectiveness has a professional development budget of approximately $1 million, and each of the curriculum offices also have uh, accounts for stipends in each of their budgets, which are part of the salary accounts, because uh, in our TABCO agreements, uh, there is a schedule of payments for teachers who participate in professional development, and it is paid out as salaries. And perhaps Dr. Boswell McComas has any additional information? Uh, as 
As we've discussed, um, Ms. Mack and members of the board, good evening. <laughs> First, let me say that. Um, we do provide uh, professional learning in a variety of venues. So sometimes that is during the work day. Um, but of course, we have moved away from that given all the turbulence of the last two years. Uh, we offer professional learning after school. That's where uh, Mr. Saris was explaining our teachers are, uh, can be paid a stipend. Uh, we also offer professional learning um, throughout the summer. So uh, we strive in every way possible to provide the professional learning opportunities for our teachers on those um, invested um, resources, Ms. Mack. Um, so thank you. I know that this is a, a particular uh, point of um, commitment and passion for our, a number of our board members who are committed to professional learning. So thank you. And I think I have I would, a follow-up question, ahead. please. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Yes, Sarah. Uh, Ms. Mack, just wanted to also mention that uh, we have a four and a four point seven million dollar tuition reimbursement program, which uh, provides both co cohort based professional development as well as self guided uh, access to uh, uh, advanced credits, masters, uh, PhD, et cetera. So I think that's that's part of our overall opportunities for professional development. I, I appreciate that, but I'm specifically talking about things that we know help our students, like open court, SIPs, Reading 180, System 44, um, Lexia and Wilson. Um, we purchase these things, we spend millions of dollars, and again, I can't get a count of teachers who are trained, um, and that's why I'm asking, what is in the budget to get teachers caught up on the many products that we have purchased so that our students can start reaping the benefits. Okay. So I, I, Ms. Mack, I, I know you're asking where it is in the budget. Uh, fundamentally, that is, as um, Mr. Saris explained, in the, the budget for professional learning. The platform um, that we have moved to will assist us in that format of um, being able to pull the data in terms of how many people have been trained on what. And that platform is in this budget, and where would that be? I guess that's a Mr. Sarah's question. Well, I, I think I can't really expand in any more detail on the line items, but I think generally each of the curriculum offices and the Division of Organizational Effectiveness and some Title II funding as well, uh, which is also under organizational effectiveness, uh, all have professional development funds. And it's, it's an ongoing annual part of, of, our, of every budget and this one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask a follow-up question to Ms. Mack's question, and then, Ms. Mr. Thomas, you've been waiting patiently. Do these product vendors offer their own professional development, and is this something we can include in our contracts when we purchase the products? So, yes, um, Ms. Hen, as um, I know when you ran contracts committee, um, many of the products that we purchase, the vendors do offer professional learning as part of the package. We do um, take advantage of that. Um, often, uh, as you know, when we bring contracts, contracts forward, excuse me, uh, we explain how much professional learning, how many hours, or how, depending upon the, the structure uh, that mm -hmm. is being offered. So we do That's partner easy. with the vendors that um, we purchase their uh, materials to ensure that we are training our personnel um, to the highest degree possible. Thank you. So, th because they're the experts, right? And it, it, they're their products. So, we generally they bundle them. And one of the questions I would ask on contracts committee, thank you, um, is to separate those out, to understand the cost between the product and the professional development. And I believe what Ms. Mac, Mac is asking is where in the budget are we? showing that, that reflected? Is it rolled into the product cost? And if so, then we're paying for the professional learning. We just can't, the board hasn't seen where that investment is going in terms of how many teachers are receiving that professional learning. And I think that's what she's asking for. And if we can't see it, then we don't know if our investment is, is adequate enough for it. Because anecdotally, we hear that it's not, but we can't 
we don't know what the true costs of that are, and we want to ensure that our teachers are receiving the adequate professional learning that they need, because if we're buying the products, we want to make sure we're also buying the professional development to go along with those products. And if they are bundled, or if we're being offered bundled bundles, let's do both. Yeah, so I'll just add that um, as, as we've been discussing, uh, the vendor often provides a service that we contract with, but then you also see the cost of that not just rolled into when we bring products forward through contracts, but you also see that as Mr. Saris um, indicated in our budget to, per, to pay our teachers to attend the professional learning. So that's where you're, you're gonna see that combined um, cost. And I'm sorry if you answered this already. So where would we see that? Where do we see the compensation for our staff to attend the professional learning? So as Mr. Sarah said in uh, the Office for Organizational Effectiveness, uh, the budget there supports professional learning and pays for it. And all of my content offices where you will see uh, Mr. Saris indicate we also have money to pay stipends to teachers to attend training. So that one million, I believe that was the, the figure that was tossed out, the organizational effectiveness budget for professional learning, is that correct? That Mr. On, on page 335, uh, salaries and wages uh, under the Title II grant, $3.8 million is essentially professional de development because it is a teacher quality grant. Uh, and I'm going to see if I can find any other uh, larger amounts uh, in one place. Do we know off the cuff, uh, or can the board find out approximately how many hours that would translate into what we've budgeted in terms of teacher professional development? Ballpark. We can use the the contract rates to give you an estimate. Yeah. That'd be great if we could receive that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Uh, so on page 253 of the of the big book, um, uh, it references that $409,000 are being allocated to world languages. So how much of this money is being allocated for the development, implementation, and expansion of new uh, world languages and expanding the continuity of languages within zones? What page did you say? What page was that? 253. That's the main page outlining all curriculum and instruction. Sorry, so could you repeat your question again? Yeah, so how much of the $409,000 allocated to world languages is for the development, implementation, and expansion of new BCPS world language offerings and expanding the continuity of languages between zone schools? Good evening, yeah, so. Mr. Thomas. I just wanted to make sure that my colleagues knew I was here. Um, the funding that you're referencing actually comes from the World Languages Office budget. So the funding you specifically reference actually pays the salaries for the staff in the Office of World Language. So indirectly, some of the work of the staff in the Office of World Languages, the coordinator, supervisor, and specialist, is about developing coursework. But that's not a separate item in the $409,000 that you reference. Okay, would it be possible to request funding for the new and, and the, the continuity of those courses? So we are actually right now in the process where my teams are submitting curriculum writing requests. Um, this is the time period where we, offices submit requests for what they wanna work on, and the World Languages Office has submitted that request. Dr. McComas and I are working through all of those requests to allocate them, so that is in the process right now. Oh, incredible, thank you. Sure. Um, so uh, my next question is, um, how much of the money, w how much money would need to be allocated to offer every student um, a, every AP exam they might want to take for free? Yeah, so I, I know that's uh, Dr. Wisted, um, but if you'll give me just a moment, Mr. Thomas, because I know we uh, really address these questions. Um, what you'll see last year is we, um, using title um, funding, we are able to cover the cost of students in financial need uh, for advanced placement. So your question really is, what would it be if we covered for all of the students um, taking the advanced placement? So if you'll just give me a moment to locate my notes. Number eight. Number eight, thank you. So 
So based on um, our invoice from the College Board last spring, um, uh, we spent $696,118 um, to cover exams for those who um, were struggling. If we were to cover all of the, the AP exams um, for all students, last year we had 16,000 uh, tests were taken. Um, and so it would be um, just shy of a million dollars, 900,000. Okay, thank you. And where would that be allocated in the budget if we were to ex increase it to 900,000? Would it still be in the title funds? It would be in the college and career readiness. One of the things that we need to keep in mind when we're dealing with federal funds, there is an issue of surplanting. So when, the, um, we, when, when we use um, federal grants, to, federal grants are meant to be the extra, the, the part that we are not funding through our operating budget. So the minute we as an organization move to cover that with our operating budget, that um, we can no longer use that federal grant because that becomes supplanting then. So we would have to pick up the total cost. Gotcha. So if we were to add this to the operating budget, we would have to pick up the $696,000 from lot or, or however much it would be this year from title grant funding with the additional cost of the exams that aren't covered by that funding. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mack? Yes. I just wanted to um, clarify that while I appreciate if we include the cost of professional development. We have to look at this as the cost of time. Teachers have one one hour meeting a week. They might have two days during the summer. We have classes that have 60 hours of professional development. We have to include money in this budget for creative ways to pay teachers um, and not, not, not give them the choice, but to pay them, to incent them to get this training done because again, if we keep buying it and we don't train anybody, it, it just doesn't make sense. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pester. Thank you. I'm not sure whether this is a real question or a comment, but I wanna thank all of you for trying to put this together and point out that there are very few singular places in the budget where you can account for uh, why the programs we're buying and the things that we're doing can be uh, discussed or pointed to. Because a part of where you have to look in this budget, now, unfortunately I have left my book home, um, so I don't have it all marked, goes to the way we staff as well. So some of the problems in terms of our teachers not getting professional development or those things about which Ms. Mack is speaking is going to happen as in, in terms of the, the new organization when we have those executive directors uh, who will be present in buildings who will be guiding some of the training. In addition to which, when we're talking about one afternoon, remember that we still have uh, days that are department chair day, department meeting days, and a sundry of other things that schools use to be able to train internally. And that you are taking from one section the, the kinds of opportunities that people are getting as individuals and go back to their schools, then there are larger ones, then there's the pay, then there are the people who work with them. So when you look at the budget and you're talking about how we support our teachers, how we support the growth and the program, it can't be easily located in one area. Now, here's the question. Am I just going way back and I'm not making any sense or is that so? Because that's how I break up the book when I look at the budget because I was told I never talk about instruction, but that's all I ever talk about is instruction. <laughs> so I just wanna, I mean, am I sort of getting to that, that it's in a myriad of places in the book? Y yes, I would, I would uh, affirm that um, the funds that we spend for professional learning does uh, flow through multiple line items within the budget book. Rather that is part of the contract for the materials uh, with the vendor, rather that is in stipends in individual content offices or within uh, the organizational effectiveness. 
uh, division that is dedicated to professional learning or in our Title II funding, which is federal grants dedicated to professional learning to fund professional learning for teachers and school administrators. So you will see that flow through all of those budget lines within the book. And just want to add that uh, page 148 has that additional $1.1 million uh, that I mentioned uh, in a single location. Uh, and, and if we were to add the Title II funds and the organizational effectiveness funds, uh, it would be just under $5 million. And uh, the a typical half-day program of instruction uh, is paid to a teacher at about $275 uh, per half-day, and that would amount to about 18000 Courses. Okay, Ms. Joes, and then thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you to staff and Dr. Williams for this budget. Um, I see this 22 full-time staff development teachers that have been added. Uh, is that just for the elementary school? This is in addition to the 65 staff development teachers that we have, and they will be spread across all schools. What is the, will the staff development teachers also help in training? Because I see that being heard a lot. And my follow-up question is, you've allocated, Dr. Williams, 75 IEP chairs for elementary schools. I think that's great because previously that task was done by APs. Um, so I think that's a good move. And if you could also explain on those two issues. Thank you. Uh Yes, so thank you. Um, first, the staff development teachers, exactly as you said, part uh, primary work for our staff development teachers is job embedded professional learning. We know there's nothing as good as being able to work with teachers directly in their classrooms, and that takes the form, excuse me, that takes the shape of everything from doing model lessons uh, to um, real-time coaching in classrooms with teachers around pedagogy and implementation of programs um, so that we can implement those with fidelity. Uh, it also uh, looks like the work where our staff development teachers facilitate uh, common planning time for teachers who may teach the same grade level so that you can hone in and use data-driven methods uh, to support planning uh, and rigor to the standards. It also looks like um, professional learning that can occur after school. Uh, it can be one-on-one -on -one professional learning with teachers during their planning time, a small group uh, during the day. Sometimes they uh, offer drop-in sessions during, um, what do you call it, chat and choose during uh, different planning times depending upon what's being offered. The beauty of the staff development teacher is that as a principal, you really have somebody dedicated full-time to help um, constantly drive the quality of instruction to ensure that we're hitting the rigor of the standards and that we are looking at student work and student data to drive those next steps of instruction. Um, and so it's a very powerful model uh, of professional learning and impact on student learning. Uh, your second question related to the elementary IEP chairs. Thank you. We're very excited to bring this uh, request forward this year. Uh, as many of you know who attend our CCAC meetings, our CCAC uh, advocates have been really asking for this for, I know personally, at least six years that I have been um, participating in CCAC and, and our instructional program. And, um, and so this effort is really, to your point, Ms. Jose, to bring forward and provide uh, personnel who can take on the work of facilitating the IEPs to ensure compliance and proper monitoring at the elementary levels. The added, the value add, besides just in, in uh, dedicated support with expertise to that work at the elementary level, is that it also does free up our assistant principals who then can also be in classrooms helping uh, to monitor and coach instruction um, to support the overall school instructional program. At that, I'll ask uh, Dr. Pirandozzi if you have anything you want to add related to the elementary IEPs. Good evening, Madam Chair, board members, and Dr. Williams. Um, it is a terrific question, and we're glad to have the opportunity to speak to this position specifically. But it will, it will assist as a designated position to support and maintain compliance. It, that position will also support students, families, 
and our schools in implementing and monitoring the IEP process, as well as the services that are provided. They will also be able to coach and assist our special education providers in appropriate goal writing and IEP writing to ensure that it is a um, implemented IEP for each student, not only compliance, but in the best interest of that student for academic achievement. Thank you, I think it's wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Thank you. Dr. Hager? Um, thank you. I, um, uh, in follow-up to Mr. Thomas's question about world languages, um, I understand the, the point that was made about the mid-level administration on the, on the page that he mentioned, but then um, following through with the rest of the budget for curriculum instruction, it seems that world languages are, are cut a lot under other instructional costs and um, textbooks and supplies, and yet it sounded like we were thinking of, of expanding that offering. So could you explain kind of how that, that works? So 254 to 255. Yeah. Uh, uh, good evening, Dr. Hager. I'm gonna start, and then I'll certainly let my um, budget experts take over. We did consolidate, so, um, as the executive director of academics, we do work to um, be the most efficient we can. So some of the money that you see moved, for example, um, the fiscal assistant under Dr. McComas worked to pull all the textbook resources that were sprinkled throughout offices together to be able to streamline efforts for things like digital content or textbook purchases. So it isn't so much that they were cut. In a lot of instances, it means, so for example, several years ago, you'll remember we had a program called Middlebury. That was part of our elementary world languages program. We sunset that program. So those funds were redirected to support textbook purchases under the chief academic officer. So what you'll see over time looks like a lost is also reflecting that consolidation for textbooks centrally, which is what enabled us to do things like bridges and some of the other large purchases we've done as a system. So for textbooks and supplies, we went from $2 million under Chief Academic Officer to $7.7 .7 million, huge increase. Um, and then you see these other areas where they drop off, but that just means they're still there, they're just in a different exactly. section. Exactly, yep, way. exactly. All right. All right, that actually answers a lot of my questions. So <laughs> thank you for that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Dr. McComas, yeah. if there's teachers out there that do, that want the professional training, and they're not getting the kind of direction or cooperation or support from their local schoolhouse administrators, would it be acceptable that they reach out to you and Ms. Shea for guidance on how to pursue this professional training? Absolutely, absolutely. We will offer it in multiple formats throughout the year, so there's many, many opportunities. Great, because I, I hate the, the idea of somebody that wants that training and can't get it, and th they're sure there's a lot of people out there that don't want it. But the people that want it ought to have the opportunity to find that path. And they might have some, they, they're going to have some struggles to find the direction, but to be able to reach out to you guys and you help them, you know, secure the training they need. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Causey. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. The Public Works uh, Implementation uh, Consulting Company. Um, has as their next steps leading off. The BCPS school board and superintendent have an opportunity to use the public works report findings and recommendations to transform the school division, its culture and climate, its operations, and its academic program to become more effective and higher performing. The cost of ignoring the findings and recommendations as well as postponing any consideration of implementation is a disservice to the needs of BCPS, its stakeholders, staff, and the students they write on page 119. Um, the board received this two uh, weeks ago, and I'm wondering where is it available digitally, and is it, uh, a, a, is it available publicly, which is the superintendent's update evaluating the implementation and the <clears throat> fiscal impact of implementation of public works recommendations. So to provide some clarity, that document is an addendum to the budget that reflects FTEs. And a part of the discussion, um, as Dr. Yarber reported a month ago, the division work groups are looking at the efficiencies. Um, the division work group, the blueprint. Let's go 
one more stakeholder. Ooh, how could I forget? Stakeholder work group. Um, and so what you have, uh, what the board has is the actual FTEs in terms of what was recommended, what was moving forward, what amendments I made, and what are what FTEs are still on hold. So we provided a hard copy to the board. So can this document be attached to the uh, executive content for board members, but also I believe it'll be helpful to have a uh, publicly available version as our funding partner who paid for the public works uh, consulting. Um, I would imagine we'd want to understand the, the fiscal impacts. We will consider that request. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Thank you. Um, was there an update on the SRO training program? That was one yeah. of the questions. We have that yes. uh, cost for you, and I'll just note that uh, that cost is not currently in this budget. It's about $156,000 is the estimate. Would you provide the number of the SROs and what sure. that would total if uh, we were to pay for every SRO? Uh, we have 81, and it's estimated that 70 would go, so the cost would be about $156,000. Uh, um, you know, it would be about $20,000 more if all 81 went. So that was in the budget for this year, but... That is not in the budget for either year. Isn't it something that was in the budget in the past? Uh, it was in the past. Okay, well that's concerning that as we speak of professional development for all of our educators and staff members, they are, as we unfortunately have seen today, so critical for our school system that we would not be able to provide that is, in my opinion, uh, short-sighted and honestly unacceptable. Thank you, Mrs. Causey. Um, Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Ms. Shea and Dr. McComas, just a real quick question, and I know we've had some of this discussion before. So when we purchase a new pr program, um, let's say it's targeted to reading in elementary schools, uh, is the responsibility for professional training at the schoolhouse level, or is it in the central office and tracked that way somehow to ensure that it's, it, it's handled throughout the system? Yes and yes. <laughs> so we at the central level uh, coordinate uh, and organize that professional learning to provide it uh, in multiple opportunities um, th during the day, after school. Uh, sometimes on the weekends, throughout the summer. So we, we provide all that leadership and coordination, right? Um, what is offered at the school is really uh, a combination of things. It can be uh, the school's part may be helping to find the time for teachers to attend the training, right? Um, it could be if we push forward the training sort of in a train-the-trainer model, depending upon what it is, we may train the reading specialists, for example, at the school level, and then they provide the, the training at the building level. And so professional learning comes in many many um, shapes and sizes, if you will, depending upon what it is, um, and our um, approach to try to reach as many teachers as possible. Eric, believe you me, my goal is to have every teacher trained um, in all the programs that we have. Uh, Ms. Shea, I don't know if you have anything you'd like to elaborate on that, because it, it's really a, it's not an either or, it's a, it's a yes both. Thank you. I would just um, add to, we do have a responsibility in the master agreement with our teachers union that when we roll out a new curriculum, we are providing multiple opportunities for training. I think the challenge that Dr. McComas spoke to that has been especially true this year or the last several years is about time out of the classroom with the challenge in finding substitutes. Um, we did offer so open court as a good example because we were rolling it out at the same time that we were in the pandemic. Much of that training that normally would be face to face was done virtually through modules that were um, completed at the schoolhouse. And so we did have to rely more on um, schools for supporting that just because of the nature of, of other challenges. Um, we do also have a tremendous amount of staff turnover. So we never really finish, even though we might say this is year one for grade two, 
if we hire several, you know, uh, grade two teachers, it's a constant challenge to keep up with that. So it is our obligation. It's our goal. It's also our love. We want our teachers to feel successful when we roll that out. Um, but beyond just funding time, substitutes, um, and the staff turnover are additional challenges that we continue to work through. Thank you. This question, I guess, is uh, first to you, Dr. Uh, Williams, and it is about SROs. I believe it, it was around 2019, um, and it was, I think the county executive took it out when he did, and I could be wrong, so Mr. Tantless or Mr. Ferris, you can correct me. Um, but but it's it's been a couple of years. It's been during this pandemic time that we have not had it. And the cost, I'm just wondering if there's any way, even just in conversation with the county executive um, for the amount that he named uh, for how invaluable that service is. Uh, that's to me a small amount because I'm talking about the national training. That's what was removed. Um, and it's known that that national training is the best. Um, we get, they can get, some of them get the state training, um, but I would like that to be a consideration in your conversations because we need them so sorely. We've always needed them, but now we, I think it's imperative. So is that something that can be discussed in some way with the county executive? Yeah. Yes, Ms. Pastor, we, we can always follow up with the county executive on that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pastor. Um, I have a comment and then Mr. McMillian and then Mr. Thomas. So um, on that vein um, of national SRO training, I move to amend the FY 2023 budget to include um, funds for the national SRO training. Second row. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Um, any discussion board members? I think several of us have spoken to the need for it, so I don't feel the need to speak, but Mr. Thomas? Yeah, I'm just not familiar with the exact components of the National SRO training. I, I heard the presentation from Ms. Pastor. I don't know, I just, I, I wanna learn more about it. I know it's pro amazing, but I just, I wanna know more about it before I vote on it, because sure. that was all. I'm gonna ask Mrs. Causey if she'd like to speak to it, as she's familiar with it. If you would like to speak to the, the motion and answer Mr. Thomas's question. Certainly, thank you. So the National Association of SROs um, puts on this training every year, and um, as Ms. Pasture pointed out in the back, um, we have paid for it before um, <laughs> before uh, the pandemic. Um, and <clears throat> in fact, in 2020, Baltimore County's um, officer, Daniel Moore, was awarded the national award for being the most outstanding SRO in the nation. And uh, I was uh, privileged to be able to go to that award ceremony and she attributed her success uh, to the training that she received through the national organization and to the support that she received from her colleagues and from uh, the school principal and the, the school system. We have a very robust program at central office uh, in collaboration with our SRO program and the Baltimore County Police Department. Thank you. Any other um, comments or questions? I see a couple in the chat, but I think those were on other items, unless they are to this motion. Um, Ms. Scott? Yes, I was um, wanting to know, and um, I'm not sure if it was already said, the cost impact of what that would do. Mr. Tantliff, would you please to the repeat budget? The uh, approximately $156,000 to provide the travel. Okay. For 70 to an estimated 70 out of the 81 to go. Okay, so that would be in addition to um, what's already in the budget. So basically we're adding $156,000 additional to the budget for the training. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Joes? Yeah, just a budget question. Is that something that would typically be funded by the county council or is the, does that onus fall on the school system? Um, an amount uh, like that, we could either self fund it within uh, one of the organizations or it could be posed as a new initiative that goes to the county executive. So those are both really options. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, 
any board members that haven't spoken to this yet have questions? Um, Ms. Rowe? I think it's important to realize too that one of the things that this um, NASRO training does is it specifically teaches SROs how to deal with a variety of different situations um, for best practices for dealing with children with disabilities and like which times they should be engaged and which times they shouldn't, then these are things that are not part of the normal um, police department training, but the, this is such an, an important extension of their police department training because SROs are dealing with children and in a completely different environment than the regular community that they're trained for that I feel like it's very irresponsible to um, not train these individuals who are in our schools when we offer every other employee training. Thank you, Ms. Pester, and then Mrs. Causey. Okay, thank you. Uh, one of the, the main things for me that the national one does that's important, you heard recently someone say that we needed to have a larger police presence in some of our schools, around our schools, one of the things that this training will do is to help them not just deal with the students, it helps them to deal with other police officers who come in um, ready and sometimes exacerbate the situation. So they, learn, they know how not only to defuse children, but they learn how to defuse adults. Um, and they learn how to to, to do the things within that school. If you've seen any of these videos, you've watched the action. So I'm, this is my question again, Dr. Williams. If we don't put it in the budget, is that a conversation? And I have already had the conversation, so I sort of know the answer. But is that, is, is that a conversation you can have with the county executive so he will pick it up if we don't put it in? Or do we need to put it in so he will take it out and make it a county thing as it was just described? What is the best process to move forward with this? So uh, I can't really speak on what the county executive may do um, but I think it's worth having a conversation with him um, about what we have just discussed tonight. I do want to clarify, if I may, about some comments, some qualifiers about irresponsible, not looking at this. I want you to go back to our town hall meeting where Sergeant Thomas talked about the training for SROs. Very specific training and how they are working together and then police officers choosing to become an SRO. And so um, I, I just want board members to be careful about some language about this budget not reflecting professional development for SROs or irresponsibility. Um, clearly, if this board, there was a motion made to add it to the budget, we'll be happy to add it to the budget. In addition, I'm happy to follow up with the county executive um, <coughs> I think it's also worth a conversation with our leader of our SROs to understand uh, what this conference will look like, because I think Mr. Thomas asked that particular question, and we can move forward from, from there. But uh, again, I, I think our SROs, I know our SROs are well-trained, they and work well, respected. and well-respected. And we are so pr appreciative of having SROs uh, and that partnership with Baltimore County Police. Thank you. Thank you. Could, could I add some answer uh, Mr. Thomas's question? The, uh, the conference registration fee is $450. Uh, the conference takes place between July 3rd and July 8th in uh, Aurora, Colorado, and the remainder of the costs per person are travel and accommodations. Thank you. So I'm just making sure I have everyone in the chat that asked a question. And has anyone not had the opportunity to ask a question who would like to? No. Ms. Joes? Just as a follow-up, the SROs are only in our high schools, correct? Do they have them in elementary and middle school? 
They do? Yes. 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 And in terms of disciplinary action, is that still done by the administration? Yes. Yes, Ms. Jones. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. If there's no further discussion then, Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to clarify the conference is in July. So does the funding for the officers to attend this July, does the funding need to be in fiscal year 22 or fiscal year 23? The registration and the fees will be paid in FY22. Okay, thank you. And we had asked at the previous um, work session, what is the value of the SROs and who pays their salaries and benefits? Uh, they're paid by the county. Uh, don't have the cost right off, but you know it's probably 150,000 a person times 80 people with benefits and everything. I'd estimate. Could you please put on your mic, Mrs. Scott? Thank you. I move to amend by adding the superintendent will allocate funding up to 150,000 for SROs to attend this summer's NASRO training in July through the fiscal year 2022 budget operating funds. Is there a second? Okay. There I'm not hearing a second to that motion, Mrs. Causey. So we have an original, mo the original motion on, is still on the floor. That fails for lack of a second. There is no amount um, specified in the original motion, which provides for any amount that is needed to um, provide funding for this conference. So given that there's no additional discussion, um, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? No. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Other um, comments or questions or discussion, board members? Mr. Thomas? Yes, I'd just like to state for the record that um, I'm unable to participate in the conversation regarding motions and amendments to the board. Um, I find that to be uh, very disheartening considering that that means that the only student representative on this board of education cannot even discuss something as important as SROs in our schools and be part of that conversation. That is most disappointing and I'm even more disappointed that this board uh, and legislative priority did not approve um, allowing the mob to be able to participate in those conversations. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Rowe? Um, Madam Chair, this board has always allowed the student member to participate in conversations during budget discussion, just not vote. And it's, it's unclear to me as to why our student member would be under that impression. Okay. Uh, Mr. Do you have a, a comment because this is taking us off topic and staff, I want to honor and respect staff's time. They've it's late in the, the day. It's almost nine o'clock and we're, we need to move on to the next agenda um, item. I move to suspend rules and allow the student member to vote during this conversation. Uh, un unfortunately, that's not, not something that the, the, the board can, can overturn. The uh, education article sets limits on the student member's uh, voting ability. The student member has uh, full uh, power and uh, responsibility and ability to participate in the budget discussions that have been going on, uh, but once uh, a motion has been made, uh, uh, the, the student member can't vote on uh, that item. Now with a two-thirds uh, vote of approval by the board, the student member could uh, participate in the debate, 
but still could not vote on any matter regarding the budget. This is what I'm proposing, is that we suspend rules and the student member be allowed to participate in the debate but not vote. Second. Any discussion? Okay. Dr. Hager, could this be for the whole budget discussion or do we have to do this item by motion by motion? Mr. Bersades? It, it can be the entire budget discussion. Well, any, any, you can do it for all motions that it would allow the student member to participate in debate on all motions regarding the budget, but still not vote. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Causey? Point of clarification, um, I was looking over minutes and previously um, another SMOB made motions and amendments, but is that really not appropriate? I just want to clarify. Yes, that is my view. The SMOB cannot even make a motion regarding the budget. Okay, I just wanted to clarify. Um, I support the input of the student member board, um, and but I also want to say that I feel and I believe all of our colleagues here around the dais feel that we are all s representing the students. So I just want to put that out there. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Jones, did you um, have a yeah, clarification? Yeah, my clarification is for Mr. Brusades because previously our student members have participated very vigorously during conversations and debates during the budget. So what st stopped Mr. Thomas from doing it? Sure. There's a distinction between participating in the discussion, like when staff is making presentation and board members are having their two minutes to ask questions. That's separate from once, once a motion is put on the table and uh, a member's ability to participate in a discussion on the motion. Now, with a two-thirds vote by this board and there's a motion on the floor right now, uh, the student member would be allowed to participate in the discussion, in the debate on the motion, but not vote. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mack? Um, that was actually my question, so I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rowe, would you please repeat your motion? I move to suspend rules for the duration of this meeting and other budget work sessions to allow the student member to participate in all discussions, but not vote. If I, if I may, it's not suspending the rules. It would be m making a motion to allow the student member to participate in debate on motions regarding the budget. Should I restate that? Please. Yes. I move to allow the student member to participate in debate on motions concerning the budget. Thank you. And I believe it was seconded by Ms. Joes. Is that correct? Thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Further discussion on the budget for members. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. McComas and staff, um, is there any way to expand or reduce the cost of AP exams without kind of taking away the current uh, grant money that we have with the title funding? Um, I know that some schools provide incentives where they provide maybe half off for some of their AP exams if students are receiving, uh, you know, higher grade levels. Um, I think those may be coming from fiduciary funds, but is there any way that we can reduce the cost without taking away the funding that we already have? Um, Mr. Thomas, I'll have to be genuine in that. I would have to reflect on how, how might we do that in a way that, again, does not violate the supplanting laws related to federal funding, right? Because I understand the, the aspiration here. Um, to provide that support for all students um, and to do it in a way that optimizes uh, resources. So uh, I don't want to speculate on what might be a creative way. I, I appreciate the opportunity to reflect on that with our team. Okay, thank you. Um, 
And so if you reflect on that, could you provide an update at the next meeting? I'm sorry, sir. Oh, at the next meeting, could you provide an update on, on that um, reflection? I can work with Dr. Williams and perhaps provide something through the weekly update as, as Dr. Williams. Thank you, that would be great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Other questions, board members? No? Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Good evening. So I just want to remind everybody that we have another division of departments to work through. Thank you. The next item. Thank you, Kathy. If you could put the PowerPoint back up on operational excellence, thank you. We must also invest in our critical infrastructure needs. The budget, this budget does that. Next page. Next page, please. Uh, within facilities, uh, there's three FTEs to support the Build to Learn initiatives, which cost 902,000. Nine preventative maintenance FTEs costing 3.8 million. Contract maintenance, housekeeping, and ground support for $6.7 million. Facility specialists, software, filtration, flooring, and utilities, which is one FTE, and $2.9 million. Next page. Within information uh, technology, we have uh, security software at $1.5 million. Technology support contract tours support contractors for student devices at $4.9 million. Classroom display panels. Uh, which we discussed earlier, 2.7 million, and uh, device cost reductions of $6 million due to the conversion of high schoolers to Chromebook and reduced lease costs that we've been being able to negotiate over time. Next page, please. Within the Office of Transportation, we have a total of $2.8 million of initiatives. That's $300,000 for replacement vehicles. $2 million to support bus contractor fees, $400,000 for vehicle lifts, and about $100,000 for transportation safety vans. And with that, uh, we can go to the next page and we will take any questions. Thank you. Board members? I will ask staff to come to the table at this time. Facilities, transportation. Thank you. And information technology. I apologize. So we we'd like to start with facilities, which is in the order of presentation thanks okay sure that's great thank you and miss Mack you're up first uh, my question is about IT miss hen okay facilities questions mr. Thomas thank you miss hen so welcome everyone um, how much would it cost for us to provide at least one gender-neutral bathroom in every BCPS school Thank you for asking that question. Uh, let me see if I can get my papers. I think that question was included in the uh, questions that we received. So there is not a fixed cost to provide bathroom in existing building because it depends on where the location is, uh, how much it will cost to provide the plumbing at that location, and how much will it cost to make uh, modifications to heating, air conditioning, and lighting systems. So I cannot give you an average number. We tried to do it in a, in a different subject, and we found that it could be 15,000, it could be 150,000, it could be 500,000, depending on how much plumbing has to be moved, how much utilities have to be modified. 
So, so that's the first part of that question. And the other part that was here is uh, we wanted to let the board know that the new constructions generally provide one bathroom uh, in, in, the, in, each, in the first floor. And uh, most of the have single stall bathroom available for all students and faculty. Any change in designation of that bathroom, that is the responsibility of the school administration. Okay, so you said most of the new constructions. Do you have the number of schools that 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 is? I don't have that number, but I can get that for you. Uh, in in if if you want me to guess, it's fifteen to twenty schools that we have built in last uh, ten years at least. Okay, um, so can you get that number for me as well, just to confirm that? Um, so then, would you recommend? I think we should be moving towards having a gender neutral bathroom in our schools to have inclusive schools for all students. So. I mean, could we possibly devise a strategy to have like a 10 year plan for implementing those um, gender neutral bathrooms, a five year plan, and then each budget cycle go over how much that would cost in, in that specific budget cycle for a certain amount of schools, a cluster of schools maybe? So that is a separate conversation that's not part of the operating budget. Any construction or modification is part of the capital program and board is familiar with the competing priorities in capital construction. It is difficult to meet those needs. Uh, uh, so th that's the response to your question. Okay, so in this operating budget, is there anything that we can do to begin the process for having more gender neutral bathrooms in our schools? So like I indicated, the new schools have that. When you talk about changing existing schools, on a large scale, that's going to be another initiative in the capital program. And you know, that's, uh, that's a totally separate conversation we are here today for operating budget. Okay, and so for say the schools that have single stall bathrooms that aren't currently redesignated, I mean, there would be the cost of creating new signs for those, for those bathrooms. Is there a way that we could have that information by the next meeting? You know, schools that have single stall bathrooms that are currently not gender neutral, to then see how we could provide for those signs, provide for other things in those bathrooms for this budget? Yeah, so providing sign is a part of operating budget. Okay. So if we receive a request for making any change or providing sign, that has to come from the principal, from the school administration. Okay, but is there a way that we as the board can say, instead of leaving it up to schools to decide whether or not they're gonna have a one gender neutral bathroom, for us to ask, you know, for schools that currently have a single stall bathroom, for us to mandate that those are gender neutral bathrooms. So that's not part of the operating budget because what we are talking here today is funding to provide changes. So the funds for providing a sign is already there in the operating budget or operating budget can be adjusted to get those funds. So that's not an operating budget issue at this point. What do you mean by funds can be adjusted? So the funds are available for signage in general Mm -hmm. And if a request come for sign, that can come under the operating budget, and we do not need a change in, in this operating budget. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you for asking that question. Thank you. Ms. Jones, did you have a facilities question? Thank you, Ms. Han. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Dixit, currently I see you have put in one senior supervisor full-time and two senior project managers for FY23, but you say you do need additional 2012 FTs by 2024 because of the increased construction. I recall the, the board approving a contract for construction management services. If the board was to approve the 12 full-time employees for project management, would that still, uh, the CM services, would that still be needed or would that be supplementing your full-time employees? That's a very good question. So uh, we are in conversation with the superintendent about um, hiring new folks for tremendous increase in our capital efforts. So uh, as you know, there are about 40 to 42 positions we have in the, in the capital budget. And um, our staffing is based on 100, 200 million dollars a year that we have been spending in the last 10, 15 years. Now, all of a sudden, because of Build to Learn funds 
and because of the work that superintendent has done, all the additional funds are coming. So we will need expansion. The choice is between using those funds to fund the salary of project managers or hire our own folks under uh, operating budget. And we recommend more operating budget, more position because that is more cost effective. But then again, it's the matter of competing priorities within the operating budget. So when superintendent is faced with that decision, it's whether you hire a teacher or you hire a project manager. So that conversation continues. I appreciate the support we have received from uh, Dr. Williams. And uh, so we, we decided that we'll have a three-year plan to add the positions. And in the meantime, if there's more need for staffing, we'll try to fund it from the capital budget. Thank you. So essentially you're telling me that by sorry, by contracting those construction management services out that it was a contract we recently approved, That's we will right. actually be spending more dollar-wise because of the lack of the current resources we have, uh, which would have helped if we just yeah. put it that in the operating yeah. budget. So that, that's a good question we talk among ourselves. If money was not the limit, if there was no limit to money, and if the folks were available in the market, as you are seeing in the uh, construction contracts, the same thing is for the availability of talent, they're just not there, and the price is higher. So there's always, if we can get it, we are hire, uh, we hire those folks. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rao. So Mr. Dixit, I would like to know, what would be the cost, and if you're already doing this, please indicate that, of setting up some sort of a system so that students, teachers, the general public could issue things that they find wrong with our buildings, similar to the county code complaint system, so that if someone frequenting our buildings were to file this complaint and it would be viewable to the public, they would be able to see a facility staff response, whether a work order was created from that complaint or whether it wasn't and why, and um, could then track the repair. Um, other school systems have apps that do this sort of thing, and I wanted to know what it would take for us to do that because I think that would go a long way towards helping us to keep eyes on our properties and preventative maintenance by having people who see things and who are in the buildings all the time report them as opposed to depending on just the one maintenance service person in each building. So thank you for asking that question. Uh, and there are several aspects to that. Number one is the communication process between the school uh, or the requester uh, to, to our folks. And if you will see, recently we have taken the first step by getting a school dude software package to improve the efficiency of requesting work from school to us. So that's one piece. The second piece is we would like to have a central source to submit that request, and that being the school administration. We have designated uh, the building operations supervisor as the person who's in communication with teachers and principals and is accountable for submitting the request, which is happening, and school dude is going to improve that efficiency, efficiency of that process. The final piece is our ability to do. So there are only so many folks uh, and so many resources to be able to respond to that. So we hope and we are optimistic about it that in future we'll have a combination of an improved process, process, availability of resources to be able to respond to that in an effective manner. So that will be uh, the ultimate dream. So have we looked into what it would take to have an app for public reporting? So school dude is the process which will give us the flexibility to send more and more requests. I'm sorry, I'm, because you're wearing a mask and I'm hard of hearing, I cannot tell the word you're saying. School okay. what? The school dude is the name of the software package. School dude? I know, dude, yes, dude. That, you okay. got it right. Yeah. 
So it and had nothing this... to do with the mask. It was just, it's just, it's I, well, difficult to accept. I need to, I need to <laughs> see people's lips but sometimes. The, the school dude is the software package name, and it has different modules. And uh, so we uh, have started using that as part of our request is to extend uh, for the fees. And that will be the first step towards improving our communication between the requester and our folks who are responding to that. As it, we get success in that, we'll expand it so that hopefully anybody can send requests. Uh, so there is built into school dude a public facing element that would allow the public to make and track requests. So that part is not there. The, 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 the school dude is for the school folks to submit the request. So if you are general public, you still have to go to the school administration that we need a new unit or new light. And the school mm -hmm. BOS, the, the operations supervisor, still has to submit that request. I think what I'm looking for is a little more public accountability than that. Yeah. And if someone could produce what it would cost to do that, I would appreciate that in a weekly update. So we can uh, look at that and- we'll I'd like to know what it would cost yeah. to have a public facing app to allow the public to report to the school system mm -hmm. things they see that need repairs in our buildings yeah. and would then allow them to get a response back from the school system to have that whole thing public facing so that the public can see this is the complaint that was made, this is the response back, et cetera. So we can work on that. Thank you. Ms. Joes? Yes, Mr. Dixon, this is a follow up. This board just approved a work order program that you're just mentioning and the board does not like technology. It costs a certain amount of dollars. We already have principals, custodians in the school building, teachers reporting, and I've been on school visits where teachers have reported um, doors that are rotting. And now they can do it in a work order online app. I'm just not very comfortable with opening that up to the random public. And also the dollar amount of doing that. This is a public school facility and we have security. We can't just have random people walking in. I certainly am an engineer and I'm qualified to do that and I don't want to walk in and give random work orders <laughs> of fixing this and that. It's just not appropriate, I think. But you're certainly, you know, you could provide a, work, a dollar amount for that app. I just think it's redundant. So our past experience has indicated that what you're saying is correct, but, uh, but we can al always look at other, other processes that's available out there. Thank you, Ms. Jones, and I know Mrs. Causey is waiting. I, I do have a follow-up comment and question to Ms. Rowe and Ms. Jones's comments. I've used School Dude, so I, I'm familiar with it at CCBC. Nice program, um, but then again, to, to Ms. Rowe's point, I'm the end user. I submit a request, I can see the status of my request, I get the visibility that Ms. Rowe sp um, speaks to, and it's nice because it is transparent. I can see the status. I don't see anyone else's requests, of course. It's it's just my own, and that's all I need to see. So I think there is a balance between being able to see the status of requests and being able to follow up with privacy of not being able to see everyone else's request. I also like Baltimore County government's app and the ease of use. It's modern. You can you know log a request. I've used it to log potholes and have had the you know pothole filled the very next day. They come out, they fill it, you get a, mo a little alert on your phone, hey, we filled the pothole. <coughs> I mean, it's fantastic. And you know that type of um, modern app, I mean, school, school dude isn't the latest and, and greatest, but it, it fits the bill. It, it meets the need, right? So yeah. I, I would like to know, um, I think we should move towards that in terms of a long-term plan and somehow moving toward allowing anyone who reports an issue to be able to see the status of their issue and to know it's being followed up on, not simply our, not simply, but not just our facilities team. Um, that's the purpose of school do to allow internal folks to use it. We just approved that tool. I think there is value in what Ms. Rowe says in being able to allow those who report issues to know the status of those and to be able to close that loop. And there's, an, there's a compromise here that that we should aim for. Um, Mrs. Causey, and then Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. This board um, 
in a previous operating budget cycle made a motion to uh, limit lead in uh, water uh, supply units in our schools by lowering the level of um, acceptable use um, from five parts per million to zero parts per million. And we put in a budget item for that, which was not funded by the county, if I recall, county executive. Um, is there a line item in this budget to address those faucets? And what is the status of um, the lead it, that's found in faucets? How many faucets are turned off, et cetera? So I'm going to ask my team members here if they are aware of it. If not, we can always get back to you. So Mr. Roberts, Mr. Roberts, because you haven't met some of my team members, on my left is Mr. Roberts, who's Director of Support Services. And on extreme right is Ms. Diane Hegberg. She is the fiscal supervisor, uh, fiscal officer for facilities. So if any one of you have a response to that question. So no, ma'am, there's not a, a specific line item uh, related to uh, replacing, you know, any of the fixtures which are you're bringing them down, bringing them down to zero. Excuse me. Um, all of our fixtures had previously met the uh, state requirement of 20 parts per billion, and then you know, please forgive me, I don't have it right in front of me, but I believe the board then passed uh, a motion to reduce that to five parts. That's correct. And we then complied with that. So at this stage of the game, we do not have any fixtures out there operational that exceed five parts. And um, again, I'd want to come back to you to confirm this statement, but I'm relatively certain that all have either been replaced or a decision was made that they could be taken out of service. And I think that's a rarity. Most of them were replaced and then retested to confirm that they were in fact below the five parts per billion. microphone thank you um, so my next question is in the public works implementation recommendation um, number 183 it's 2-60 planning BCPS should study available BCPS facilities which can be repurposed for use as a professional development center and complete the cost benefit analysis of an in-district facility versus annual external contracts for sites and venues um, is that something that's being considered? So that's really not an operating budget question. If there'll be conversion of any facility, it'll be a capital project, and it'll be part of the uh, capital projects, capital budget cycle. Thank you. The impact on the operating budget would be there, there are expenses that have been spent in the past to uh, lease hotels and convention spaces. So that... Um, I, I would request a follow-up of the, you know, plan for that implementation recommendation. Um, in page two of three of the document that I referenced earlier, um, this one, um, there were several recommendations under chapter five, facilities, construction, use, and management, and um, all except two are being held over to fiscal year 24, and I'm wondering if we could understand the rationale for that. So if I could understand the question a little better, uh, uh, let me ask any of my team members, did you understand what the question is? No, um, I, don't know um, I believe what Ms. Causey is asking about, Mr. Dixit, is in Chapter 5, it's a bunch of position seniority changes, and I think um, those are all being looked at and evaluated, and their uh, organization's not in a position right now to make any final decision on those changes. Those are not new positions. Those are just changes in seniorities. I believe everything in there. If we could receive that in the answers to everything else in detail, so that would be the decision was to place it on hold to FY24, Ms. Causey. That's the answer. Well, I'm sure there's rationale because there's rationale sure. for... Rationale yeah. is that we're in the midst of a reorganization, looking at cabinet and then drilling down, and the decision was to just place that on hold at this time until we were able to finalize those, the cabinet level and then those that report to the cabinet level. And my next question is related to uh, Hereford High School Agricultural Program. They currently have a historical barn that they're trying to preserve, and then uh, they need a new barn to actually um, 
provide the instructional areas. Um, so what consideration has been given to utilizing um, CTE funds and or capital funds um, to start the planning for that? So there are several issues mixed in that question. So let me see if we can uh, go step by step. The barn that we are working on now has nothing to do with the agriculture program, okay? There has been conversation out there that it is for instructional program, it's not. So there was conversation about preserving a historical piece, which is what that barn was. The conversation has been going on for last uh, seven years, six years, or whatever that time frame is, but never ever the funds were received in the first four or five years. So again, I want to clarify that to the entire board, and I think somewhere in the, uh, in the update we have provided that information or you'll get it. A Couple of years ago, we got a small grant uh, uh, for, for preserving that historical barn. We have made three different attempts to do the work in compliance with historical society, um, working with the community folks, and even in the third attempt, the cost is a lot higher than what the grant covers. So the last part of it is that the local elected officials have been informed, and my understanding is that we will be asking for additional funding so that we can get it and hopefully someday complete it. So we want to set the record straight that it is nothing to do with the program, it is not CTE part, and the cost is because of the historical issues involved with that. Some of the community folks have said that people from certain faith can do it a lot cheaper and you don't require any contract. Unfortunately, we are required to have review by historical societies. We are required to, have, uh, to follow the procurement process that BCPS follows. So that's the quick update and we'll provide all of this in writing to you. Thank you. I was actually referencing the new barn yeah. that the school uh, needs for its agricultural program, which is the only one in Baltimore yeah. County. Yeah. So that's what I was asking yeah. about. So the new barn, I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. Um, what is the CTE program? I don't have any knowledge of any program. Uh, so, and, and it is not part of our capital program. So if there will be a CTE program or a new lab of some kind, it will not be part of operating budget. It will be part of the capital program. Okay, I was curious if the operating budget would be used for planning and the Planning is also provided by capital budget. Okay, thank you. I'll follow up with Dr. McComas as an academic thank program. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. All right, um, I'm, I'm going back to your presentation where you talk about contract maintenance, housekeeping and grounds of $6.729 million. Is this money <clears throat> necessary because we don't actually have full-time employees to, to take care of this, so we're supplementing with contractors? It's in the presentation. I'm, I'm not sure what page it is, 14, 14 I think. Uh, this is contract maintenance, housekeeping, and grounds. Okay, so as this thing includes, indicates, there are uh, plumbing contractors, there are HVAC contractors, and then there is housekeeping, so a small amount for housekeeping, and mowing contractors, snow removal contractor. So there are two, three different pieces to it. One is the preventive maintenance. As the board has talked about, and I hope Ms. Mack is listening to this conversation, we have been continuing to... I'm here. Okay. <laughs> so we have been putting a lot of emphasis on our preventive maintenance program. You will see as part of this request and throughout the budget, wherever we can, we see a need for it. We are improving our preventive maintenance program with the hope that if we improve that program, there'll be better reliability of that equipment and there'll be less failure. So when you look at the preventive maintenance program- I'm sorry, and Mr. Dixit. Mr. I, I appreciate this and I know we're limited on time. 
Um, I wasn't asking about preventative maintenance. Um, I was asking about the maintenance, housekeeping, and grounds because I recall we spent over $2 million on mowing over the last summer on like an emergency contract that came to us. That's why I'm asking, so, is this just a stopgap money so we can fill those holes? So we have vacancies in a lot of those positions and the grass has to be cut whether we have people or not. So we are working on one hand with our HR to fill those vacancies, but while we are in the process of filling vacancies, we are using some of these contractors to, to keep Supplement. the going. Okay, thank you. That was this is my favorite subject. I can talk, talk about it forever if you want me to, <laughs> equipment by equipment, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thomas? Thank you. Uh, does this budget take into account House Bill 205 and Senate Bill 427 from last year, which passed to require all Maryland schools to provide a minimum of one dispenser of menstrual hygiene products in every elementary school and two dispensers in every secondary school by October 1st, 2022? Yeah, I have that information here if I can get to it. So, um, the, if we follow Senate Bill 427, the due date is 10-1-21, requirement for one dispenser in elementary and two in secondary. It'll cost about ten to $12,000, and uh, uh, we can accommodate that, that in our existing budget. But if you go to the uh, all schools and all unisex restroom, this requirement is not due till 9 one 2025. And that will be a heavy hit, maybe a couple of hundred thousand dollars, two hundred thousand dollars. So uh, hopefully by the time we get to that point, we'll be able to do that. How much? Uh, so is it already in the budget for this year, since it's a requirement? The, so the ten to twelve thousand dollars can come out of our regular supplies budget that that is already included in there. And correct me if I'm I wrong. I believe that's correct. Yeah, yes, that's correct. Yes. Okay, and if we were to expedite this, say do it all now in every single um, female designated restroom, mm -hmm. you said it would be a couple hundred thousand dollars. That's right. That is to meet the. Uh, 9 one 2025 time limit. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we should be able to do that. Uh, uh, and gradually we are working towards that. Okay, is there a way that we could expedite that like over two years instead of over, you know, three years? So all of these things are matter of competing priority. Uh, so we look at it as to what is needed today and what resources do we have today. And so, so that, that's the be best answer I can give you right now. Right. I know that in the bill it states that the governor shall include in the annual budget an appropriation oh, of $500,000. So does that have any relevance? If it is, I'm not aware of that. I, I, I can't answer that. Yes, we would be able to participate in that. I have no idea to what extent $500,000 goes statewide so i don't know if that's a realistic amount typically we're about 10 percent of the state's enrollment so if we got fifty thousand um, dollars that might be in line with our expectations and uh, i just don't know how far that would go okay thank you Mr. thank you thomas miss jose you said your question was answered okay thank you other questions? Dr. Hager? Um, I just wanted to follow up on Mr. Thomas's questions. Um, so did, just to be clear, you plan to, to implement this gradually over the next few years, or we're not going to wait until 2025 to do it all at once? That's our intent. That's your intent? Yes. Um, and I know that um, Mr. Thomas asked this question um, in reference to the budget, but then there's the cost of the actual products. So is that going to be included in the budget as well? So it'll be, we still have time. We'll be included, including it in future budgets. So right now our focus is 
meeting the existing Bill 427, which has a due date of 10-1-21, and we'll be able to comply with that. The money is in our budget. And then we'll gradually move forward every year. So our intent is to, to do that. The money for the products and the dispensers. That's right. The dispenser without a product is That's right. not useful. That's right. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rao? Yes, yeah, so maybe someone could clarify. Right now, girls can go to the nurse's office still and get supplies if they need them? I don't know that part. That is, that is, that is correct. Okay, so the, it's not like we're leaving them with nothing. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions, discussion, board members? Okay. Hearing none. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, IT next. Thank you, team. We'll ask um, information technology to come forward. This mic. Followed by transportation. Okay. okay. <laughs> And FYI, just for all the board members' information, we are doing two minutes for each of these three items. Thank you, Mr. Mercedes. I would like to introduce to the board our new Chief Information Officer, Pedro Agosto, who is joined by Jim Corns. Welcome. This, this is his first week in the job, board members. <laughs> So we'll be monitoring your questions, and if we are unable to answer, we'll get back to you. Fair enough. Thank you. Well, hopefully we won't even go there, so hopefully we'll be able to answer them all. Okay. So Ms. Mack had a question um, last time. Ms. Mack, is your question on IT? Yes, it is, Ms. Hen. Go ahead, Ms. Mack. Um, welcome um, to our newest member, and my question is this. Some of our schools... Um, that offer programs like art and engineering have computer labs that have had desktop computers. Um, it's m my understanding that these, pro the, the, these students use programs like Adobe Photoshop, Premiere Pro, and Inventor, which we currently provide virtually. Um, so my question is this, is there any money in this budget to replace the actual desktop computers because I am being told that laptops, even the best laptops, do not have the processing speed to really utilize these systems well. And when, and since they're, since the programs are not on the desktop, when the students go to use them, that they often time out when they're trying to bring them down from the cloud or wherever they are. Yeah. So I don't know if I said that clearly, but if you need any clarifications, let me know. Sure. Uh, so what I would suggest here is for any of the uh, lab equipment or any lab computer, computer labs, computers, that um, unless we have it, and Mr. Cormans can confirm if we do or do not, um, what I would suggest is getting a spec specifications for the applications to be running on that so we can understand what the memory uh, space requirements would be uh, to make sure they're going to run properly. And um, we should also look at the refresh schedule for those, for those equipments. I think we can get to the point where we can spec out those machines to better fit the needs um, of the use in the uh, computer labs. Thank you. I love that answer. Um, could you provide more specific information as to when that would happen, because I'm, I understand that these, um, when the system, the computers or laptops time out, all learning stops and teachers go on to different lessons. So it's it's somewhat of an emergent type issue. Okay, um, so Jim, what I would suggest is that we open this up as a regular um, incident or uh, just a ticket so we can have somebody investigate, do the, inventory of um, the equipment. I'm making the assumption here that the computer labs are running 
standard um, software across all of the schools. Maybe a good assumption or not, but I think we need to look at what the standard software set would be. And if I hear that they're running virtually, um, it's interesting. So what, what I'm going to suggest is that we open this up as a, a um, IT support incident, and we can send the field technician out to do the inventory of that. Thank you very much for that answer. Thank you. Um, I saw Mr. Thomas's hand next, I believe. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Um, so how are we determining which schools would be prioritized for this first round of $2.6 million fundings for the display panels? Sure. So um, it's actually going to be dependent on um, the um, equipment. So schools that have um, that don't have the adequate amount of uh, technology, the, the existing projectors, or the equipment is outdated, those are going to be prioritized. Um, but the intent is, and we're going to be run, once um, we do get the equipment, this is going to be run as a managed project through Department or Division of IT. So the goal is to have um, all of the 7,000 units deployed within 12 months. Oh, so all 7,000 in one year in the 12 months, but paid. And over the That's going to cover, so the 2.6 is for the uh, leasing of the equipment. Um, that price tag also includes the build and installation of the equipment. So, right, so we're looking at first year uh, equipment rolled out, and then the outlying years would be the ongoing leasing. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. Um, I was going to just share that. I remember when I was in my kindergarten class, and we had first, uh, one day we didn't have a Promethean board, one of the old white Promethean boards, and the next day, there were Promethean boards in the classroom, and that same Promethean board, 13 years later, is still in that kindergarten class that I, I wasn't before, so I'm excited to see these panels uh, being introduced, especially considering the life cycle of technology, so thank you for this hard work in IT, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rowe? Yeah, so um, to continue on with the subject that, um, Board Member Lisa Mack was discussing with these computer labs. It's also come to my attention a similar type of situation where we have desktops from 2013 who teachers are being told can't be re-imaged and then they're actively failing in classes. And um, it, we're, it's the dysfunctionality of these computer labs is actually obstructing instruction right now today. So the other thing that has come to my attention is that, is it true that teachers are not allowed to change a light bulb on a projector without a technology person coming out and it takes something like six weeks? And I just wanna know, how much money do you need in this budget for us to put in this budget for you to be able to do all of the technology maintenance in the schools that needs to be done in something remotely like a timely fashion? Because I have like, kids I talk to are waiting weeks to have their tickets, support tickets fixed. So the, clearly we need to throw money at this problem. How much do you need? Well, part of in, in the budget ask, there is the 4.9 million um, for um, contractor support for exactly what you're talking about. So field services, the break fix, um, because we found that um, in the new environment with the Chromebooks being deployed, the time um, to repair, the time to resolve, uh, the expected time to resolve is a lot shorter now than what typically would have been if you, um, if what if a technician were going out for something other than the device that the student needs to do, uh, to be able to go through their day. Uh, so that's where that 4.9 million is uh, being requested. That's for additional staff uh, to be able to uh, provide additional um, bandwidth to be able to handle uh, these issues, the technology issues that come up at the different sites. So if we get you that money, what's a reasonable amount of time frame for someone to wait for a ticket to be resolved? So what I would need to do first, because I, can, I can't give you that answer right now, um, part of what I'm doing um, this week into the next, the next few weeks, I'm in the discovery assessment mode. 
So one of the things I'm actually doing is baselining our IT services um, delivery. Uh, time, to res time for resolution for incidents, um, the current backlog that we have, that's gonna give me that baseline to be able to determine where we are and then figure out what can we do to the process to improve the efficiency. So it is a deliverable that I will have, I just can't answer that question right now. Thank you and welcome to the school system. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see who's next. Ms. Joes, I believe. Thank you. Um, welcome aboard, Mr. Augusto. And I guess you got to hit the ground running day five and you're already on the budget session. Um, I see that, well, you have the 7,000 classrooms that Mr. Corns had been pushing for a couple of years. Today, the board approved that $2.6 million for uh, modernizing all of our schools. So that's already approved today. I think I'm, I'm happy about that. I also see that uh, we've kept the one-to-one -one device ratio yes. and reduced costs. Can you um, elaborate? Because I heard about the whole uh, desktop issues in, and I don't know if Mr. Corns can fill in some of those questions. I've gone to Western Tech and I've seen they have elaborate 3D printing machines and sometimes uh, CAD software, which does require a lot more robust memory to run uh, the software, modeling software, they've used right. GIS, which also requires, and you can do that on laptops. Do we still use desktops for those software programs for SREs, enterprise GIS, CAD softwares, or are we using desktops? And, so, and I know I asked you a lot of questions in the Yeah, I'm trying to, so <laughs> is the question, are we still using desktops for yes. that equipment, or for the, that, that type for of software? For those softwares, so the enterprise GIS softwares, CAD softwares, and our 3D printers. Versus um, what, I mean, I'm just trying to figure out what the alternatives to using some kind of computing, a desktop or lab, I mean, what's the computer that we're talking about? What would be the alternative that the, the software would be running on, if not a, a CPU? Right, so p folks have been asking about using desktops and my issues, are we using desktops, are we using laptops for those programs? Okay. So, okay. M Mr. Jones, uh, we, we, have a, we have kind of a, a bifurcated system in that. And so we have lab labs in some schools that are designed for support of a specific software title. Those CTE labs, uh, normally, um, we do refreshes through the Perkins grant, um, and that's on a schedule that's set with our CTE offices, as well as uh, being uh, augmented by uh, information technology providing desktop devices. We also have other programs that uh, will run on our student laptops. Our student laptops are actually uh, more robust than may may be believed. We're, we're running a pretty high-end i7 processor. We've got, um, eight gigs of RAM in them, they're, they're fairly robust. Uh, so we've been uh, meeting with good success with things like Photoshop and, and uh, the Adobe products in that nature. We've also migrated over to a VDI solution, which is also the way that Project Lead the Way is going. They're taking advantage of Amazon Web Services um, uh, uh, virtual environment because what they're realizing is that many school systems are moving to uh, less expensive devices. So in, in that nature, we, we tend to favor a desktop in a, in a place where a lab might be, but as uh, uh, I'm sure Mr. Dixon would be able to come up and also talk about, we, we're talking about very um, uh, valuable real estate when it comes to creating a lab in a school versus the ability to say, a, uh, create a mobile lab that would support the need for the software. So, so we're, we're, we're investigating both directions of a laptop, for use uh, for these higher end programs as well as uh, retrofitting desktops. Got it, and so as we downgrade to the Chromebooks, the Chromebooks will not be able to run some of those programs. And so you would have to go to the and higher end laptops for yeah. those. Uh, so and, and typically from my experience, so running um, any of the high processor um, software, so the CAD programs will require um, a desktop or a laptop that's been retrofitted with, uh, and I would say more than 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 um, the eight gigs that you had mentioned on CPU. So, those are high processing um, applications. Going to require more. That's why part of what I was saying 
I wanted to take a look at the labs and spec out what software was running on that so we could um, set up the equipment to meet the needs, the processing needs. Thank you so much. And sorry I put you in a spot. It's only your fifth day. So. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Joes. Mr. Kuhn? Uh, good night. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so I'm looking at page 245 in the budget book, and just to kind of clarify, uh, my question on this page, um, and it's under network support services, um, I'm looking at other charges, and it's, an, or it's a proposed $8 million charge, and I'm, I'm curious if we could just get an explainer as to what, what compromises $8 million of other charges. I don't know if it's a specific project or equipment or. Yeah, you have me on this question. This one I'm gonna have to defer. Mr. Kuhn, that's going to be comprised of a, m multiple things in there. Um, I'm, I'm trying to get our, our, our breakdowns of, of things that we normally uh, put underneath of other charges. Um, this is a little more uh, probably deep in the weeds with uh, where we are. Um, I'll have to get a, a You can just answer. send me an email. Yeah, I'll I send just, you that. Yeah, yeah we can get your breakdown with that. that Thanks. Comprised of. Sure. Ah, so that $8 million, uh, I've, I've had a sneaky suspicion, but I wanted to make sure. This is our telecom, which is the uh, outlay that we put for uh, fiber to the schools, uh, paying in those lease services, paying for internet service, um, th those kinds of uh, charges. So these are the ones that would be uh, the ones we would also apply for a lot of E-rate reimbursements on. So that's what hides in that other charges line item, which is our interconnection between all of our schools are leased circus, circuits from our county government as well as Comcast, as well as our uh, internet per, uh, provider uh, Comcast as well. All right, thank you. I'll, I'll provide any further questions around that because I know we've, con we've had conversations about this, but other charges is just a large catch-all, and that's a large number. So, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Hager. Yes. Um, so, in the superintendent's report, we were talking about um, should there be an inclement weather day, we could get permission from MSDE to go virtual as long as we had a one-to-one -one device ratio for pre-K through 12. Mm -hmm. And then in the budget, we are doing one-to-one -one for K to 12. And we're about to expand our pre-K because of the blueprint. Mm -hmm. So are we budgeting for one-to-one -one ratio computers for pre-kindergarten students? Is that the plan? We are, Dr. Hager. Um, so if the budget book uh, should reflect pre-K to 12. That's uh, my apologies for not making that, uh, that uh, realignment. But we have been providing devices to pre-K students. And is, I know that that was the pandemic response, but is that our... We've incorporated it. With, <laughs> to we, give every get a we, we've, we've incorporated it into our annual highest expenditures because uh, the the um, right sizing to one to one uh, was uh, accomplished through uh, ESSER funds, mm -hmm. and so we've now incorporated those into our uh, annualized spending. Uh, when we go to release uh, devices for the elementary school, it will include the entirety of the enrollment of elementary. I was under the impression that wasn't a, a best practice. It was just an accommodation we had to do because of the pandemic, but I, I could be wrong to have kindergartners all have their own laptops. I, I, I thought we were getting away from that, but I, maybe I'm wrong. So the, the, the use of laptops in classrooms is always going to be driven by the teacher's need and does powerful <laughs> words. Um, <laughs> so um, are, are always going to be driven by uh, the teacher's uh, work in their lesson. And so uh, whether or not the access is available is an important distinction between constantly in use. So uh, best practice for any uh, teaching model would be to have multiple access to multiple different uh, methods. And so there is a, uh, a, a really strong case to be made for, regardless of uh, the amount of time 
that if every student needs to be doing something at the same time, that availability needs to be there. And with our current pricing on Chromebooks, it is not the same uh, implication as it used to be with a high-end laptop. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. So I have a question next, but welcome, first of all. Thank you. And I could talk IT all night, so I promise I won't. <laughs> Um, I have a multi-part question. Um, following the ransomware attack, many, if not all, of our on-prem applications uh -huh. were migrated, that we developed and maintained in-house, were replaced with SaaS solutions. Can you speak to the pre- and post-environment um, in terms of total cost of ownership of these applications and impact on the operating budget, given the move from a fixed cost model of IT with significant asset depreciation to a variable cost model? What is the breakdown of on-prem versus hosted costs? And how is the staffing model and associated costs changed with the shift to SaaS solutions? Okay, very good question for... <laughs> for day five. One, yeah, day five, right? Um, that is something I will have to take a look at. Because part of my discovery right now is um, I'm working with the network group to understand our entire um, inventory. So. I know we have very, a small smattering of on-prem uh, resources. I think they're mainly for, um, I think for some of our DNS and we have a couple of backup servers. So the footprint is very small. Um, so if we're comparing, so to, if the, if the question is, are do we looking at total cost of ownership and the on-prem environment that we had prior to going to the cloud and what we're at today, um, we'll do some analysis, but typically um, your total cost of ownership on an on-prem environment, especially if you're um, looking at running servers that are running um, high-end or um, the systems that are running on multi-processor servers, um, running that, maintaining that in-house, you have to look at um, your um, Divide, or the equipment owner or the equipment costs, you have to look at the cost for um, care and feeding of those systems that would either be done through contract staff or through uh, full-time equivalents. Um, that goes away um, in the cloud environment because at that point all you're doing is, is paying for usage um, of your resources. Um, and the amount of time to, if you're, if you're going to set up for application development, if you're setting up um, a sandbox development QA environment to support um, delivery of systems into your production environment, that also spins up your cost for, um, for your total cost of ownership. So I have to look at the, sure, what we covered prior to moving all of these systems to the cloud. And, and I don't need specifics. I guess what I'm driving at is, does this budget reflect the move? Because we, this was a significant move. I mean, light years from where we were prior mm -hmm. to this attack. And it's where we need to be. But it happened so quickly that I want to understand, does this budget reflect that move? Because all of a sudden, we went from an environment that was largely on-prem to this hosted environment and all of our, you know, virtually all of our applications, as Mr. Corns can attest, were replaced seemingly overnight. Okay. And the the budget may, if if we started with last year's budget, it doesn't seem to fit. So what I guess what I'm asking is, have you reviewed it? Has someone reviewed it to say we're now dealing with apples to oranges? Yeah. And no, yeah. So how, I have not reviewed it that? yet. Um, the one thing I would that I would tell you for um, for doing the analysis is um, the systems have been running now for a, an amount of time. So we're gonna have some usage metrics and that's where your cost is gonna be on a cloud-based environment. So we'll be able to take those metrics of usage right now and then figure out, do an extrapolation if we haven't gone a full 12 months, which I'm not sure if, if we're, we've run a full 12 months yet in um, the cloud environment, we'll be able to figure out based on the expected usage, where are we? So the, the amount of money that we have budgeted to cover an on-prem, is it enough to cover the cloud-based environment? Right, and, and that's minor compared to our staffing costs because mm -hmm. the staffing needs, as you mentioned, are looked very different right. with, an on or with a hosted environment. So are we 
planning, has, has that process begun or can you, is that something you'll be looking at as you? Yeah, so I am looking at, so part of uh, my self-charged um, to-do list is actually to look at staffing um, and then to also look at, um, based on the environment that we have, um, what's required uh, to maintain and support that. And you're absolutely right. So in a cloud environment, you're looking at um, staff who will be more of um, vendor management. So working with the cloud provider, um, understanding, working with the business units to understand the usage needs and plan for that um, through the upcoming months. So totally different than having somebody waiting for a call or remoting in to a server because it went down. So. Right. Whereas the cost could be three times as higher. I mean, the cloud doesn't necessarily reduce your costs depending on this, your situation. It's, so yes, as a board, right. we need to be prepared for the fact, and superintendent needs to be prepared for the fact that our costs could increase significantly. Thank Correct. you. And welcome again. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ms. Scott. Yes, thank you. Um, I was just looking at, I believe it's page 14, where it's a device cost reduction. And I was reviewing that, and I just wanted to see, um, because it says that um, here, we are maintaining a one-to-one -one device ratio. And I just wanted to see if you could expand a little bit more on the device cost reduction. Sure. Uh, Mr. Corns will be able to speak to that one. Sure. So, uh uh, Ms. Scott, this is uh, our final conversion from our uh, high school devices, uh, which are in their fourth year of lease, uh, the, the uh, pro books that we've issued to students. When we replace those devices, uh, we will be replacing them with Chromebooks for our general ed students to carry. And so that price reduction, um, we were paying about $900 a, a, a pro book, and we're, we're bumping that down to about $300 in general for for a Chromebook, and so that's where the totality of that uh, device savings comes from. It's it's simply the large numbers and uh, the six hundred dollar differential in price. Okay, yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mrs. Causey. Thank you. Um, good evening and welcome, and um, I appreciate your courage joining the 25th uh, largest school district in the United States of America, recovering <laughs> from a cyber attack in the midst of a pandemic. So uh, we've got a pretty resilient uh, uh, a bunch of folks here that are very dedicated to doing the best that we can for our students. So um, I can't ask a question like Julie because I'm not, I'm not Ms. Penn. But um, my question does get to um, the impact of information technology on every aspect of of the system. So we have the back of the house, as mm -hmm. I would call it, and then we have the schoolhouse, um, the business units, as, as you would call it. Um, in terms of evaluating the priorities um, of your time, but also then the fiscal impact, um, there are, I'm going, I always go back, public works implementations, and there's seven key things that are on hold for the new CIO. Um, so I just want to, I'm not expecting an answer, but um, down the road as you have your transition, um, you know, to get your understanding of that, um, one of the things that's been recognized and it's um, understandable given what we've been through is there's a lot of staff morale related to effectiveness of the technology. Mm -hmm. And so that uh, business service delivery aspect of your um, resume that um, it looks very good and I'm, and I just want to say that I think that the school system as a whole should be very encouraged by the changes um, that the superintendent and the board are making to um, make our school system more effective overall. Um, the, one of the specific questions I had is um, related to the, I mean, and a lot of this has already happened, but the um, magnet programs and Dr. McComas will be your best friend too to explain to you all of the different curriculum that we have tied to technology. So and that's I'll just time. look forward to your responses down the road as they come. That's and they will thank come. You. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Causey. Other IT questions, board members? I think that's enough for one evening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.
Mr. Thomas, is there yes. an IT question? No, not an IT question. I was just going to ask. I wanted to ask a question of you, Ms. Hen. Sure. Okay, so uh, during the la I have a few questions that didn't relate to the last presentation that we had, but also don't relate to the topic of transportation next um, okay. that relate to the budget. Can I ask them after we go over the um, transportation? Can I ask about that as well? I would oh, hold them until next to put it in the chat. I okay. would hold those until next um, meeting. Okay. Thank you. We're going to do a catch up then. Catch awesome. Up. Thank you. Sure. So next we have transportation, Dr. Grimm, Mr. Patillo. Great, welcome, good evening. Mm -hmm. Thanks for being here, board members. Transportation questions? And question here in the chat. Okay, let me get off of you, there you go. Ms. Joes? Thank you. So I guess it's not lost to you, Dr. Grimm. We've had issues with transportation, um, to put it mildly. And um, we just heard from the student member that technology that would help with the logistics and uh, letting parents know in real time where the buses where are, as opposed to getting a phone call a couple hours later that the buses are delayed. Um, that was something that could have been fixed by a contract that was brought forth to this board that was rejected. So I guess the question is to Mrs. Saris. Mrs. Saris, what would be the ballpoint, ballpark cost, if you could just give me a ballpark cost, if BCPS was to install all of that um, apps and stop on cameras that we were going to get at a cost of zero dollars for a contract with the Baltimore County Police Department and Baltimore County government, what would it cost to put that in the operating budget? So um, our, our two rounds of competitive bids were not structured exactly that way, but um, from looking at some of the other systems that have done this, I want to estimate the cost at perhaps $9 million. So nine, sorry, I always tend to bump it up. So around $10 million round it would cost us for implementing something that Mr. Dr. Grimms, if you could explain, would that really help you in some of your transportation problems? So I think it would um, certainly be a step in the right direction. I, I think that that number of nine or $10 million also doesn't account for the, the integration that would need to take place among the, the different technologies and the features um, that we would need to devote human capital toward um, that were part of the package that we had previously brought forward. So overall, it would be over $10 million in terms of integration and training and everything else. I, I would need to, go, we would need to go back and look at all the individual factors, but I would think that that's fair. And, and that, that is part of modernizing our fleet. We have, uh, what, 700 or 800 buses? We have approximately 838 school buses. Right, and we run almost 13 miles a year. That's a lot of... Um, 14 mil for, almost 14, 14 million, yes ma'am. Right, that's a lot of greenhouse gases that we're emitting. So in part of modernizing our fleet, making our school buses, uh, that's a lot of miles. I think we might be one of the highest uh, greenhouse emission gas producers in Baltimore County. So this board could have modernized a fleet and my question is now if we were to put that in the budget that's going to take 10 to 15 million dollars away from other school resources like teachers and giving our you know i don't know our staff a bonus um so you know i, I want to put that on the record here because i know some members voted for it but based on facebook hysteria this board voted down this contract now if we were to put this in the budget you still have to do an rfp and bid it out correct I would imagine we would, Mr. Sears? Yes, uh, we would restructure the RFP um, to uh, uh, pay, your, pay your own way model, and uh, we'd have to look 
uh, for some guidance on systems that have done it that way and and uh, perhaps do an RFI before we did an RFP, but yes. And, and that would be then bid to the lowest cost bidder, about 12 to $15 million ballpark. So, you know, I think I'm gonna put this on the record because this board has done a lot of non-progressive decisions and this is one of them that could have helped our transportation. I don't wanna get a call two hours later after the bus is delayed. I would have liked to have seen it in real time at where the bus is, um, but you know, this, did, this board did not approve it and I'm gonna keep dropping it. it. It was a step in the back, backward direction. And uh, my question is to Dr. Williams, would, what would it take for us to add it back to the budget and do we have money, $15 million to add to that? So it would take a motion for this board to, uh, as the budget office said, an estimate to put back in the budget. Um, but we have to be clear about exactly what we're purchasing. Um, and, and again, um, I think the board heard a lot of conversation previously and we had representatives here to talk about that partnership. But um, I asked the same question, um, Ms. Joes, about what it would take and it would mean adding um, at least $10 million to our operating budget. But to, doc, to Mr. Saris's point, we would have to look at exactly what we want to do and that could um, infringe upon some other items on the budget. I certainly won't be making that motion when I knew we could have gotten that for zero dollars, so I wouldn't take that away. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question and then I'll go to Mr. Thomas. Good evening. Um, Dr. Grimm, did, did that technology um, drive the buses for us? Not yet. So the technology that Bus Patrol offered, it, it didn't put dr more buses on the road because it drove for us? No, ma'am. Thank you. That's all I had. Mr. Thomas? Thank you. So as someone who had many conversations with the routing assistants as I visited two bus lots, you know, I saw those routing assistants have to get up out of their seats and go drive buses because of our bus driver shortages, when if we had this technology, they would not be sitting, they wouldn't have to sit down at, going through the entire document to figure out how they're gonna shift the, 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 um, in the bus drivers that we have. So I, I'm requesting that Dr. Williams and Ms. Joes, you're the chair of the, the voting contracts committee, that this be brought back up in voting contracts, the, the contract that came forward again, and the board can have another discussion on that. Um, because I think that 10 to $15 million is, is, is way too much um, when we could have gotten this for free as well. So is that possible, Dr. Williams, for this contract to be brought up again? Mr. Um, Thomas, there's procurement laws that we have to follow and neither of us have any dog in the fight. I don't care which company gets the contract. We had something that was negotiated between the police department and Baltimore County government. If we were to go out there in the street, it's gonna add time, money, resources. Uh, honestly, I couldn't in good faith sit here and add a contract for $15 million when that could go to better resources like school counselors and, and teachers. So. I, that's again oh. going to be a decision of the board. Yeah, I didn't mean bringing back the $15 million contract. I mean bringing back the contract that we voted down for zero dollars. Uh, that's going to be a Mr. Dick, Mr. Um, Sarah's question. It's a procurement law. We have to follow state procurement procedures. I'm sorry, I, did, I may have missed a question. Uh, Mr. Thomas so, is. Uh, go, go ahead. So, so the question, Mr. Sarah's, was to from Mr. Thomas was can the board request that the previous contract that was voted down, stop arm contract, to come back for discussion, I thought it, Mr. Thomas said, and correct, to bring it back to the board. And, and the concern is about adding the aspects of the contract to the operating budget. So if I heard Mr. Thomas correctly, is for that contract to come back to the board I'm assuming for a reconsideration. Yes, that's exactly what it is. Williams, I, I can address part well, of I'm, that. I'm, let, me, let me just check in with staff to, just to see. I'm sorry? If there's a parliamentary issue because the board has already acted. So in order for the board to reverse its action, there, there are issues that would need to be taken with regards to that. What are those issues? It's been voted down twice and it's already been decided. 
So it would have to be reintroduced by a member that voted it down before. Okay. Oh, I see and what you're are, saying. Parliamentary. I got you. Right. Parliamentary. Mr. Sayers, there's nothing involving um, through procurement. Well, the only the, the first issue I'd want to check is the typically when we receive a bid, that pricing and those terms are good for a fixed amount of time, maybe 90 days, maybe longer, and I don't know what it was in this case. So it may be that that, that offer is no longer acceptable yep. for that reason. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Sayers. Thank you. Dr. Hager? Oh. Um, actually, along the similar lines, um, first I want to thank you for the budget that includes so much additional pay for the drivers themselves and for the attendants to be on the buses. I think that's a crucial part of, of this whole puzzle. Um, and I am aware of many, many stories, including some <coughs> in, that I'm intimately aware of um, with significant behavior problems on buses. Do you have any, um, any data on bus drivers resigning or calling out because of the behavior issues that happen on buses? Is that, is, is that, is that a major concern for our current staff? Uh, it's absolutely a major concern for our bus drivers and attendants. Um, any data we would have would be purely anecdotal, um, but that is frequently the, the major concern, the, the number one concern that we hear when we're at um, our bus facilities and speaking with bus drivers and attendants. Yeah, and I just, um, I think Mr. Thomas mentioned seeing they had to take the cameras off. Did you say? So, so currently we don't have live camera streams or anything like that on camera? We buses. do not. We have the, um, the current system that we have inside of our buses have uh, a hard drive. Uh, the video inside the, the buses record to a physical hard drive that has to be removed and put into a, a specific terminal at our bus facilities um, where the video footage can be transferred. And, and I, I do, I'm, I'm glad that the money and that we, the pot of money is going to the drivers, but I share the disappointment that we weren't able to get the safety procedures on the buses at, at no cost. I mean, this, I worry we'll continue to lose drivers because of, of these exact concerns. So that's the, that's all. Thank you. Ms. Rowe and then Mr. McMillian. Gentlemen, the $0.3 million for replacement vehicles, is that three or four buses? No, so what that actually refers to, Mr. McMillian, is um, we requested a um, part of our spend authority in our last vehicle purchase, purchases of about $250,000. So what happens is um, at the present time, when we have a vehicle that is, um, is deemed totaled or is deemed uh, the amount to fix or repair it, exceeds the value of the vehicle or the cost of the vehicle. In the past, we've had to fix that vehicle because it would take us uh, approximately 18 months to procure a new one under the rules that we have. So under the last, um, the modification that we did on our vehicle purchases, we asked for an increase in spend authority. We just hadn't funded it yet, and that's the request from this budget. So what it would allow us to do is, for example, if, if we had a, um, a van that was totaled or an engine that went up um, and we deemed it irresponsible to, to repair that vehicle, it would allow us to go out and, and purchase one in a much more timely fashion. Um, and that's, of course, under, under normal circumstances. Right now, it's extremely difficult to get any vehicles for us um, with some of the supply chain issues that we're having. But that is the intent of, of that $300,000. Okay, and the contractor fees, $2 million, that's a drop in the bucket to what we pay the contractors, isn't it? So when we look at Whitcraft and all the different contractors we use? So, um, and I can ask Mr. Tantliff to talk a little bit more about that $2 million specifically. But essentially, um, in the, the contract that was brought before the board, um, we budgeted approximately $17.5 million per year um, in our contracting fees because that was what we were spending prior to the pandemic, or that's what we were on target to spend those last few years. What we had budgeted was less than that, and we were actually moving some of the, the funds that we had from positions that were vacant to pay for those contracted services. So this is an attempt to make sure that we are um, 
accurately reporting the costs that we're spending on our contracted services. Okay. Did I say that correctly? I, yes. yes. <laughs> and so the $2.8 million, what did, what did you ask for last year? How does that compare to last year's money? As an increase, I don't believe that we asked for much of an increase at all last year. So the vehicle lifts that we're also asking for, we've been replacing those out of, out of our, our funds um, at, a, at a slow rate, and this will help us accelerate those. Um, we have 12 list, lifts at the, the Cockeysville Center that were original to the building in 1977. So rather than continue to repair those, we've been systematically replacing those. This will allow us to replace two vehicles per, uh, two lifts per year on a schedule. And one point million dollars for the safety vans. How many vans are you getting? Two. So those are that that will that's about what we need. So those are safety vans that will carry uh, special needs equipment um, around the county. We have uh, a number of our bus lots and our bus drivers and attendants who are often in need of equipment or in need of different equipment to satisfy the needs of of students. We have multiple different styles of. Um, of different vests and other security features for our, our students with disabilities. And as the years go on, um, those, different, um, those different features for our kids grow more complex. And so we need the availability of these to be able to get out into the county rather than try to have our folks come to a central location to get them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Jones? Oh, okay, Ms. Scott? Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Rowe. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Answer. I'm sorry, Ms. Rowe and then Ms. Scott. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Graham, I recall that your predecessor, um, we've been having these conversations about the new routing software that the school system bought back then. And there's been talk of, well, we purchased this and we're going to use it and this is what we're doing. And... We're now having conversation about procuring things that I thought we had already procured and implemented, which I find confusing because Mr. Thomas seems to have indicated we're still doing paper routing. So we are using our routing software. Okay. For our students with disabilities, we augment that with um, routing, hand routing as well because of the intricacy of their routing. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's also that human element. Our bus drivers in particular will, will tell you that the routing software uh, doesn't know the roads of Baltimore County like they do. So it's that interaction between our routing assistants, our routing technicians, and our drivers and our supervisory staff um, that ensure um, that our routes are being run in the most efficient way. Um, what some of the technology was aimed to do was to help us determine um, what was a planned route versus what is an actual route. So on any given day, there may be a nuance as to why a bus driver can't execute their planned route and they have to run an at what they call an actual route. And that can be because of a road closure, that can be because of an accident, that can be because they're taking on additional bus stops. Um, as we're combining different routes. So as those things become more complex, some of that technology would give us the ability to overlap, again, what is being planned with what is actually being driven. At the current state, what the routing software does is it gives us the opportunity to look at a map to say these are the kids in this catchment area that need to go on this bus and to plan them out. That's, that's all it does. Okay, so how much is the fact that we have vacancies on a daily basis contributing to the need for this on-the-spot rerouting? And I guess what I'm saying is, like, if we have a, a certain percentage of driver vacancies, that means that we're having to do a lot more on-the-spot rerouting than we otherwise might because of the driver shortage issue. And at what point does even any amount of technology not really deal with that? Well, I don't think pa uh, technology is the, the panacea to this problem. It doesn't cure it because certainly the driver vacancies that we have right now, we're sitting at 95 bus driver vacancies, which represent just over between 12 and 13% of our routes. 
uh, if we combine those, uh, those vacancies with our daily callouts and our leaves, um, we operate on many days between 25 and 30 percent of our routes being uncovered and need to be adjusted. And those are all different routes every day? That is, well, not all different routes every day. It, it depends on the duration of the leave that a particular individual was out. It depends whether a, a, a staff member calls out, a bus driver calls out just one day or they call out multiple days in a row. Um, it, it really depends on the situation. We have, we have some folks that are out on various leaves and they may be out for a month or six weeks. So uh, we have the decision of whether we're trying to cover their route each day or whether we're making some other adjustment. It also depends on, on which routes are open and, and as, uh, how we can cover them. Um, for example, a country route that uh, combines both say Franklin Middle and Franklin High students out in the country is far more difficult to combine with another route um, because of the of the duration and and the distance and the facts that it the fact that it serves two different levels of, of student so that's very different than a route um, in, in a much more densely populated area where we can either do a double back very quickly, um, which is go in, take a load of students in, send the bus back out and, and, and rework it. So our staff is, is really doing all kinds of creative things to adjust the routing practices on a daily, weekly, monthly basis to combat, uh, again, our vacancies, our call outs and, and our leaps. So if we had what is it that you'd be looking for to improve this? Better routing software or well, the GPSs on the buses? Like what? So we have GPS on the buses. It's, it's actually the, the integration, um, you know, and, and, and it's, it's clear the, the board has made their decision, but it was the integration of the package that we were bringing forth, which combined, again, some of the features of, um, it would basically be the the routing software that we're using, but a, a newer version of it, um, and how that integrates with a, a tablet and a parent application and um, some other technology that, again, would help us show our planned versus our actual routing practices where we can run those data and compare them. Right now, we have no means to be able to do those types of things. Okay, so that sounds like um, software versus a lot of camera hardware. If we just went with the cost of the software to just do that, how much would that cost? Uh, we'd have to go back and, and to take a look at that. But again, it's not just the routing software because the, the tablets and the other features would, were, are an integral part of that working together. Sure, but there was a lot of other hardware involved in that agreement that added to the cost, too, that if we're not talking about a municipal fining system and we're just talking about trying to get the buses routed in there on time, maybe we need a lot less than what was in that agreement. Um, and I guess my question is, how much would what we need to be efficient cost? Um, because... We have to get kids there on time. Okay, thank you, Ms. Rowe. Next we have Ms. Joes. I may be out of town, Ms. Time, Ms. Hen. Mr. Mercedes, does Ms. Joes have time left? Excuse me, Mr. Thomas, did you want uh, to go? No time left for Ms. Joes right now. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Scott? Uh, thank you for the explanation and everything. Um, in regards to um, transportation. What I wanted to know though was I wanted to know about the greening um, of the fleet and um, I was looking, I didn't see that in here. Is that factored in? And are, are, you, are you referring to any kind of alternative fuels, Ms. Scott? Yes. Okay, so, um, well, and this is, this is just a personal comment. Um, it's important for the board to hear that, that not all of our bus lots have running water. So I think when we talk about um, you know, alternative fuel vehicles and electrifying and the infrastructure that would be necessary to do that. We need to take a step back and think about at least three of our sites where our mechanics can't even wash their hands because um, there's no running water where they work. 
Um, so that's, that's an important factor that I think we have to look at. Aside from that, um, the electrification piece is, is one that we're starting to look at. It was part of the efficiency review. Um, there are a number of, of different uh, pathways that we, can, that we can take toward that, mm -hmm. the infrastructure being the, the biggest part of them. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. Thank you for providing the insight you have so far. Um, getting back to the actual budget, and what we're focused spending money on this coming year. I know we, um, we passed a contract, and I believe it was in the $40 million range, and it was over a few years for replacement buses. Mm -hmm. What is the plan, and, and I'm not sure which line item it is here, because you have equipment, yeah, it, other charges, things like that. In this, on page 216, right. uh, it's the equipment. All right, so it's the $9.8 million. So the expectation is that money is going to be used to purchase buses. Is that, is that accurate? Yes. We have some also budgeted for uh, regular fleet vehicles. Um, so those combined represent that are in that line item, but mm. the school buses are the larger component. Right. So when you say, and thank you for that, um, but going back to Mrs. Scott's question and the idea of adding a mix, if not electric vehicles, to our fleet, um, you are starting to study that. And who is tracking or how would we understand what grants are made available depending on where things are moving um, to actually pilot some of that or provide Baltimore County with a way to do that, to move forward? So I think the, the first um, response to that question, Mr. Kuhn, is that the, uh, the districts in Maryland that have, that have tried to just pilot with one or two buses have been very unsuccessful in that venture with either um, uh, natural gas, propane, or uh, propane buses, or, um, or electric buses because the cost of the infrastructure is so great. Um, the charging stations, the locations, you gotta have a, a you know, you have to plan, um, basically for an electric bus, you have to make sure it meets the, the type of route that you wish to run and so forth. Um, Montgomery County has entered into an unprecedented um, contract that we're all taking a look at where over a, um, over a 15 year period, they will completely electrify their fleet. Um, it is through uh, a, a, a private company that is working through public funds in order to do that. But a huge part of that, again, was their infrastructure. So many of the rest of us that, that have large fleets are looking at those kinds of models and what would be an appropriate mix for us. Um, right now, and looking at the range of electric vehicles, for example, we think that a target goal of about 30% of our fleet over the next 15 or 20 years once we begin this process would be most appropriate. Um, and again, that's assuming, that's assuming that the technology doesn't improve to a great extent, which allows for a much greater range of these vehicles. Okay, thank you. And did this, was this announcement just made? I'm, I'm curious. It was I'd made like to uh, last, I believe it was made last spring. Mm -hmm. um, several of us visited uh, their their uh, one of their depots this uh, late late summer and into the fall, where they had they just started installing their charging machines. They just took possession of, of some of their first buses, I believe, about two months ago. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> This is Cozy, your microphone. Someone needs a marshmallow. You just throw it at me, and then I'll like, remember to turn this on. Um, <clears throat> so I appreciate the um, work that you do. It's vital to get our students to school on time so they can eat breakfast, many of them, at school, and then come prepared to the classroom. So it's been um, very concerning to me personally over the last several years um, that we 
are not headed in a better direction. And unfortunately, the vacancy reports um, concerning. So question, the first question is, um, what data is available after the cyber attack regarding arrival times, past routing, um, think, you know, whatever is in your office that helps you do the work that you need to do? So uh, uh, arrival, arrival times is, is not um, a, uh, arrival times typically are, are not a, a metric that our industry uses for, um, for the work that we do. Typically speaking, over, over time, time and mileage and arrival times has been self-reported or recorded by the schools. Um, this year, certainly with the pandemic, that's, that's been a challenge for us, absolutely. Uh, there's nothing we want more than to get kids to school on time. Unfortunately, that's been a, a, a major challenge for us. Um, and um, we believe through the support of, of the board and, and through Dr. Williams and leadership that getting kids to school at all is better than what a lot of the, our neighboring districts are doing, which is canceling routes. Um, most of the ones around us have either canceled routes for a short or a long period of time. Um, with regard to your question around data, um, we, we don't use that on-time arrival data because it is lagging typically. Um, since the ransomware attack, it has not been uh, available to us, um, and it's not something that, that we would use to assess what it is that we need to do day to day to get our children to and from school. Um, a lot of the data that we use is, um, quite frankly, manual. It's, it's, it's observing um, kids at uh, getting off disembarking uh, the bus at schools to see what our capacities look like. It's following up on concerns and complaints around capacities that we get from the public or school administrators um, or other folks. Um, it's also taking a look at, at what our routes look like and how we might be able to change to improve them. So a number of the double backs and the, the combination routes that we talked about are a result of carefully reviewing what our ridership numbers are. And again, that's a, that's a pretty manual process that we use um, to track uh, what students are doing at each level. That ridership changes. Um, you know, at the high school level from season to season as kids participate in different after school activities as more juniors start to drive to school. Um, it also changes um, when, when the, as the weather changes as well. At the early ages, we do see it at, at certain schools. We have some schools where um, families choose more often than not to, to drive their, their kids to school um, versus others. So we do, we do know where those exist. We work with our staff to inform us on the changes that we need to make. Thank you for that. Um, in 2019, there was a, a BCPS school day task force uh, run by the Office of Organizational Effectiveness that concluded that later start times would be advantageous for high and uh, middle school students, middle and high school students, but staff recommended the board not take action on implementing so that transportation uh, could get the routing software implemented. That was back then. Um, so what is needed for the board and the superintendent to consider for the school system implementing what would be uh, helpful, healthier, safer, uh, provide for better academic achievement in that regard? I would need to defer that question to, to Dr. Williams or to other staff regarding the start times for schools. I, I know from a transportation standpoint, um, and I can't speak to what was said or what wasn't said in, in 2019 um, at that time, but uh, as far as transportation is concerned, uh, it would take us several months to do a, a really comprehensive review of, of manipulating or switching bell times in, in any kind of capacity of that nature because of the integral nature that, that they exist right now between our, our A, B, C, and D level schools and what those bell times are. Um, as we add new schools on, as we have magnet catchment areas that continue to increase, as we have special education programs that run students all across the county, those all factor into our bell times. Okay, and I will just say that uh, bus arrival time was a key performance indicator when I first got on the board, 95%. Mm -hmm. and 
it is key because if our children aren't there on time, especially those that need to have breakfast first, um, that's detrimental. Uh, my last. Thank you, Mrs. Clauser. All right. That's time. My last thing, I'll email. <laughs> And Mr. Thomas, did you have time remaining? You already spoke on this item. Mr. Bruseides. Mr. Thomas has one minute 15. Awesome, thank you, Ms. Hen. So my question is about um, routing assistance. Uh, when I was uh, doing my tour of the bus lots, I learned that routing assistants are being paid the same amount as bus drivers, um, even though they are actively doing the job of bus drivers right now while doing their route assistant duties. So my question is, what's the possibility for increasing the wages for our, our routing assistants? So that's uh, a an active point of discussion between uh, myself and, and my staff and human resources. Um, we've worked with a number of staff in, in position management and through Ms. Anderson's office to, to look at what, what that would mean and, and how that would work moving forward. Okay, thank you. And um, I add the whole AFSCME scale is being looked at. The whole, gotcha, awesome, thank you. And um, my other question, uh, well, I guess never mind. I was gonna, it was to Ms. Collins' point about later start times. I wanted to mention something, but I don't think it's relevant to the budget. So I'll hold that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other transportation questions, board members? Okay, hearing none. Thank you all. The next item on the agenda is unfinished business, consideration of board policies. And for that, I call on the Policy Review Committee Chair, Ms. Rowe. Members of the board, the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept the committee's recommendation to amend the following board policy, 7330, facilities and construction, financing capital projects funded by private donations. This recommendation is presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit M. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the Board's Policy Review Committee? So moved, Thomas. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the, com from the committee. Is there any discussion? Mrs. Clausey. Madam Chair, I was going to add amendments to it, but for the interest of time, I would um, request that we just postpone it to the next meeting. So there's a motion on the floor. Um, so we need to process that motion first. Is there any discuss other discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Yes. This is on um, Mr. Thomas's motion, which we need to process first. For approval, second reader. Do you want to? Okay. Is it like to refer it back to committee? Postpone. Just postpone, postpone it, to it to the next meeting. So if, if people want to support postponing to the next meeting, you just vote no to this, and then I can make a separate motion. Okay. Supersedes the motion? Yes, it supersedes the main motion. Okay, thank you, Mr. Bersades. So, Mrs. Causey made a motion to, would you repeat your motion, Mrs. Causey? I make a motion to postpone this item until the next board meeting. Yes. Is yes. It, yes, is there a second? I'll second it, Hager. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hager. Any discussion? Just in the interest of time. Um, Mrs. Causey, go ahead. Thank you, just in the interest of time, uh, because I was gonna add amendments to it, but it's, uh, I think it can wait till the next time. Okay, any other discussion? May I have a roll call vote, Mr. Thomas? So if we're voting yes to postpone it to the next meeting? Uh, yes, if yes you is postponing. support the motion to okay. postpone. Okay, thank you, I just wanted to clarify that, thank you. Mm -hmm. May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? No. 
Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. So this item is postponed to the next meeting. Yes, Dr. Hager? Good, sure, go ahead. About the agenda, I know we're very far behind. Um, is there a priority of among the remaining agenda items? Should someone want to make an, a motion to postpone something? Sure, would you like to make a motion? Well, I, I don't know what the prior, if sure. there's a, a time-sensitive. Absolutely. Um, there are a few items that are time-sensitive. I would entertain a motion to suspend um, a few items that are not Suspend, postpone. I'm sorry. To to postpone the. Sorry, bear with me one minute. Item N. Is it Nancy? And item R, one. Which leaves R two. Which I know, Ms. Pester, your motion was to add it as R one, which would leave it as R one. The legislative update. It was added as R2. Ms. Pester's motion made it R1. Ms. Hunt did. She asked to make it R1. So when I made the motion, I said R1. Right. That was the first one I put it in. Mm hmm. So that would postpone item N and item R1. If you would like to mo make that motion. So moved. Yeah. Okay, so. Ms. Rowe made that motion to postpone item N and item R1. Yes. R1 board member comments. Mm -hmm. Second, Ms. Causey. Mm. I need clarification. The motion, wow. the motion is to postpone item N and item R1. But R1 is legislative and government. It was placed, it was placed on the agenda in the wrong place. But when I made the motion, okay, then, I said R1. Then item R2. R2. Then item R2, board member comments. And it was seconded by Ms. Cal Mrs. Causey. Yes. Okay. Any comments or discussion? Mrs. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Uh, I just have a problem with um, removing R R2 from the agenda right now. I had a few comments and a few um, considerations for future agenda items that I did want to discuss at today's meeting because they were relevant to the conversation today. Um, so I, I move to amend, I move to strike R1 or R2 from the, from the motion. Is there a second? Okay, that motion fails for lack of a second. Thank you. Thank you. So the original motion is on the floor. Um, may I have a roll call vote please? Sure, it was moved by Ms. Rowe and seconded by Mrs. Causey. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Pastor? Yes. Mr. Thomas? No. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. That brings the next item to the report on the Northeast Area Elementary School Boundary Study. And for that, I call on Dr. Roberts, Mr. Dixit, and Mr. Cropper. Good evening. Okay. good evening. Good evening. So good evening, Chair Han, Vice Chair Pasture, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. This evening we bring forward for your consideration um, the committee recommendation for the new Northeast Elementary School boundary change. And joining me this evening is Mr. Pete Dixit, Mr. Matthew Cropper from Cropper GIS, and Mr. Paul Taylor. Next slide, please. Oh, the presentation needs to come up.
and you can go to the next slide. And, um, yep, that's it. Thank sure. you. I think that's mine, right? It is, yep. Good evening again. Uh, as part of the $1.3 billion schools for our future capital plan, BCPS proposed four elementary school projects in the Northeast area. This past spring, Dr. Williams initiated a boundary study process for the last of these two capital projects. Next slide, please. The new Red House Run Elementary is scheduled to open in January 2024, and the new Northeast Elementary School is scheduled to open in August 2022. will add another 1,024 seats to the area. Eight Northeast area schools participated in this boundary process to relieve or reduce overcrowding in seven of these schools. Dr. Roberts. Next slide, please. The boundary process followed board policy and superintendent's rule 1280 and was facilitated by Mr. Matthew Cropper of Cropper GIS. Each school participating in the study established a committee comprised of the school's principal, two teachers, and two community members, inclusive of the school's PTA president. Principals fully participated in the study but were not voting members of their respective committee. Only teachers and community members of each school's committee were voting members. Also included as a voting member was the chair of the Northeast Area Education Advisory Council representing the interests of the entire region. Next slide, please. In order to make the best and most efficient use of this added student capacity and in accordance with Board of Education Policy 1280, Dr. Williams approved the initiation of a boundary change which contains four phases. The first phase began with planning from July through August 2021. The boundary study was then held from September through December 2021. Mr. Cropper will soon share the details of how these meetings were conducted with all COVID mitigation practices in place. The boundary study committee met five times in this period to formulate and review various boundary change options. With a quorum of the committee members present, the committee decided that the sixth scheduled meeting would not be needed because they felt prepared to vote and move forward with the recommendation at their fifth meeting on December 1st, 2021. The next phase in this process continues this evening with the committee's recommendation being presented for the board's initial review, then further community input, and a vote scheduled by the Board of Education on March 8th, 2022. Through the boundary study, BCPS supports a process that fully engages the community and shares information about the process as it unfolds with all stakeholders. Next slide, please. Eight existing Northeast area elementary schools participated in the boundary process to relieve or reduce overcrowding in seven of those schools. This slide outlines the seven schools that participated in this boundary study for the new Northeast and Red House Run elementary schools. Also in support of the boundary process were BCPS cross-divisional staff from the Division of School Support and Achievement, Division of Curriculum and Instruction, Division of Business Services, Division of School Climate and Safety, Division of Human Resources, and Division of Research Accountability and Assessment. Next slide, please. The four Northeast Capital Projects are designed to improve and increase student capacity to help relieve overcrowding in the area. Two projects already completed, Victory Villa and Honeygo Elementary Schools, have already increased capacity in the area by 1,134 seats. Four elementary schools from these earlier boundary studies participated in this most recent boundary study for the new Northeast Elementary School. However, committee members understood and were very cognizant of adhering to board policy and superintendent's rule 1280 regarding inclusion of planning blocks that were included in the previous boundary study in 2017. Now here to share with you the boundary process and the boundary committee's recommendation is Mr. Matthew Cropper of Cropper GIS. Next slide, please. Thank you, Dr. Roberts, uh, Chair Hand, members of the board, Dr. Williams. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you tonight. I'm Matthew Cropper with Cropper GIS Consulting. And as uh, Dr. Roberts said, I was the, uh, the consultant facilitating the work of the committee as they work through evaluating boundary options and leading to a recommendation. Um, I have been working with uh, this district for about 15 years on dozens of projects, and uh, I have some familiar faces on the board and then other new faces, so it's nice to meet everybody. Um, 
The objectives of this study is to basically have a community-based process that's open and transparent to meet some key objectives. And those objectives were to reduce overcrowding in the region, uh, to create viable and successful boundaries, to effectively utilize the new added capacity to the region, as well uh, with the construction of the new elementary school, as well as the reconstruction and enlarged capacity for Red House Run Elementary. Uh, we're also tasked to support the diversity among the schools to reflect the, 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 the diversity of the, of the school system and the region. So those were our key objectives. Next slide, please. So as we work through it with the committee to evaluate options, we, we always looked at Rule 1280 and always guided the committee to, to make informed decisions that best adhere to these rules. And these rules are to make efficient use of capacity in all affected schools, uh, to maintain or increase the diversity among schools to reflect the diversity of the region and the school system. The next slide, please. And there's other considerations per Rule 1280 to maintain the continuity of neighborhoods. So as we look at moving zone lines around and trying to reconfigure the lines to account for the new school, uh, to make sure that we don't draw the lines down the middle of residential neighborhoods or residential streets. If, you if a neighborhood or a community needs to move, that they move together and not split it in half and things like that. The impact of transportation and pedestrian patterns on students were looked at and studied to make sure that we can ensure walkability as much as possible and efficient transportation. Minimizing the number of times any, any individual students are reassigned, so we uh, were mindful of the prior boundary changes that happened in the area and, and, and did not uh, ensure that we did not impact any students who had already been moved as per the prior uh, study. Uh, Long-term enrollment capacity trends and future capital plans were looked at and data and information was provided to uh, committee members for, that, for their information. Uh, location of feeder school boundaries and continuity of feeder patterns. And so this committee was focused on elementary schools only, but they were being, uh, we were giving them information on middle and high school zones in, in, in terms of how those, an elementary school may be split to a middle school. Um, and so that was information, although we weren't making changes or recommendations to a middle or high school boundary, we wanted to be mindful of the impact on a feeder pattern. Um, and then phasing in boundary changes by grade level for high schools, and that, that doesn't apply here because we were focused solely on elementary school students. Um, next slide, please. Additional considerations that we like to look at or uh, best practices when we do this kind of work across the country are uh, the use of geogra geographic features such as railroads, creeks, and major highways uh, is, as, as guides for drawing the lines along if possible, and then to eliminate existing satellite boundaries. Um, in this region, in this study, there were uh, several satellite areas, and satellite area is a, 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 a geographic area that's, that's separate from the main boundary for a school. So you have a, a, we call them satellites or enclaves. And if you look on the slide, you can see in the bottom left, uh, southwest corner of the study area, there were a couple of large satellite areas uh, that, that are not connected to the main zone. And our recommendation does, uh, does eliminate these satellites and, and provide a closer uh, commute to those communities. Uh, next slide, please. So the committee was a broad-based group uh, made up of representatives fr from within this area. Uh, each school community uh, had representation. There are 33 members total. 25 of the 33 were voting members. Uh, we had eight principals on the committee, and those principals serve as advisory and help enable discussion and give us information, but they are not voting members. Uh, eight <coughs> teacher and staff representatives were on the committee, and we had 16 parents, two parents from each school on the committee and giving us input and guidance as we evaluate the options, and then one area educational advisory council representative. Uh, we always ask these committee members that all, even though they are passionate about their schools and their communities, that they focus on what's best for all children in the study area, and they suspend those parochial interests and what's best for their child, but to focus most on what's best for all children in this entire study area, even if it may impact them. Um, we asked the committee to be available to attend all meetings, and we had five meetings between September and December to deliberate on options. 
uh, this group uh, did a really good job of working together. I was really uh, pleased with their, their collaborative work in, in thinking holistically about the entire area as they work through options and developing a plan. Um, and then ultimately, the committee uh, uh, was bringing forth the recommendation th that's presented here to you tonight via the community superintendent. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of public participation and input, uh, we, uh, there was a lot of work done at the prior, at the, uh, pre prior to the actual boundary study process starting just to inform people about what's happening and why there's a need to do a boundary study in this area. So letters were sent to all families in May regarding the change process to give them uh, 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 the, an understanding of how they can participate. And there was additional outreach from schools throughout the process. Um, the public was invited to attend all committee meetings virtually. Uh, we did not have uh, uh, people there in person in terms of the public observers like we have in the past, but there were, they were welcome to uh, participate virtually and there was a, a good effort put forth to, um, to enable that for the public. Um, and all meetings were live streamed on the BCPS website so people could go on there and watch. And then all of those meetings were recorded and they can all go, you can go back and see any meeting that's, on, that's online or that was held online right now on the uh, BCPS webpage. And then all the materials that we share with the committee, every, every time we take a packet of information to the committee at a meeting, we made sure that all that material was posted online so that any member of the public could download and print that and follow along the process just as if they were a committee member themselves. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the public was invited to provide input throughout the process via email. We gave them an email address if they preferred that. There was an online comment form that, so they could just go in and type a comment. And then we also had surveys uh, for the public information session. Uh, translators were made av available at the public information session upon request. And then, um, and then the committee did hold a public information session meeting. Um, that meeting was, was uh, the committee was present with myself at that public information session, but the public was invited to participate virtually in that, in that process. Um, to, we had, uh, after that public info session, we had a survey and a, an additional method to get some more input, and we had 228 total uh, respondents to the survey to uh, give us input regarding the options that were being considered, and it was provided in multiple languages. Um, next slide, please. So in, in, as a whole, the committee considered six total options. Uh, they, they reviewed and discussed as a group, uh, but really, like I said, worked to, in small group settings, and then they worked it individually, and then they, you know, a lot of open discussion, and it was very, uh, it, it, was, it was a good dynamic, and there was a good vibe in the, in the committee meetings with the group and working together to try to provide a recommendation here. Um, they recognized that draft option two satisfied the most most boundary study considerations, although no plan is perfect. They did have, um, they had some uh, heartburn. There, there's always something with the plan that you wish you could make better, but, uh, but they, they felt like option two was the one that best, uh, that uh, satisfied the most, the considerations the most. Uh, but we did present two options at the public information session to, to get additional feedback from the, from the public through that process. And uh, as I said, we surveyed them. Um, next slide, please. So these are some slides just to show the current boundaries and then the options. So if you, this, these, this shows you the current boundaries. And you'll note that the, the, the large yellow zone inside um, in, on the map is actually um, the new Northeast Area Elementary School is within that zone. And um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see that that a lot, much of that area turns to a tan color, and that represents the boundary for the new, nor, new uh, Northeast Area Elementary School in this particular option. You'll also notice that in the bottom left, those enclaves, those satellite areas are no longer there, and there's more of a clean look in terms of um, the boundary looks clean, but it also equates to a efi more efficient uh, uh, means of, of getting kids to school closer to home, more efficient transportation, adhering to all those rules that we were talking about. And if you go to the next slide, 
you'll see that this is option two. It's just slightly different from option one. There was, uh, we were going back and forth, and these were the two options they felt were the best to bring to the public, and, uh, and other options were considered and looked at, but these were the two that they best felt uh, wanted to uh, carry forward to the public. And if you go to the next slide, the committee uh, recommended option two at the at their fifth meeting. Um, there was uh, it was at December December the first. We we got to that fifth meeting, and um, when we were getting towards the end, the committee was you know running out of ideas and options and things to move boundaries around. And so as we started getting closer to the end we could see that they were starting to get to a good resolution and feeling like they were ready for a recommendation. And so we told them to be prepared at that, if we don't have a whole lot of new changes or edits, to be prepared to vote at the December 1st meeting if they felt they were ready. And so, and, and they did indeed, uh, were ready to, to vote at that December 1st meeting. We had consensus on that. We built consensus on that. And they voted, and of the 18 people, uh, voting members who were present, we had uh, 13 voted for option two and five voted for option one. Um, and then, which le led us to uh, option two being the recommendation. Um, option, there were some, some discussion at that last meeting about option one. Uh, people liked, some of the committee members who voted for option one, liked uh, the option one provided a little bit more relief to Vincent Farm than option two although both options did a very good job of providing capacity relief across the board and uh, in, 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 in adhering to our objectives. But option two was the one that ended up uh, getting the most votes and is therefore the recommendation. Next slide, please. And this is the, the, the map. And when you look at this map, you'll see the black outlines show you the current zone boundaries and then the background color is the recommendation. So you can kind of see where the boundaries shifted and how, uh, and, and how we, the committee did provide relief to, uh, to all of the schools in this area and uh, did a really good job of, of doing that. And it's an exciting time for this area. They're getting all this new capacity and a much needed capacity relief for, mo for the schools in this area. Uh, next slide, please. And these are just some uh, statistics, and just to, uh, I'm not going to go into detail on these, but these basically the data and information that the committee was looking at as they evaluated options uh, from start to finish. So we were looking at the capacity, state rate of capacity of the buildings, what's the uh, uh, current utilization, how many kids are uh, coming into a zone from out, from out of zone, and those types of statistics. And you'll see that one key thing with this is if you look at the orange colored cells, you'll see the, the percent of utilization of the schools before the, the new schools come online. And then in the recommendation, you could see how the balance of utilization is across all of the schools in the study area, a very good balance of, of, uh, of utilization and equitable solution here as part of this recommendation. Um, next slide, please. We also evaluated uh, demographics of the schools and looking at uh, several different uh, demographic characteristics of the schools, both current and uh, for each option to, to determine what the impact would be on demographics of the schools. And so that was also part of our, uh, part of our uh, analysis. Uh, next slide, please. Number of students impacted, so we were calculating at, for each option how many kids were we moving uh, as we uh, worked through an option and just trying to minimize the impact while, while adhering to, our, uh, to the rules and considerations. And so I, I think it's, a, it's really a testament to the process in that uh, we moved about 913 students and that's with uh, building a, a, populating a brand new school. So that's the very, very good work in terms of accomplishing the, getting the job done and moving as few students as possible. Um, next slide, please. And we were looking at feeder patterns. This is what I was talking about, the impact on uh, feed, feeders from elementary to middle and uh, how they're split. And so that was a part of the data that was being evaluated as all options were being considered for recommendation. Uh, next slide. And then the walk zones, we did, uh, we did have some prior versions that had some students moving 
out of a walkable situation. The committee really uh, pushed back on that, and we, we, uh, we worked to uh, modify the zones and the options to ensure that any student who's currently walking to school is, can maintain that walkable uh, status. And so this basically shows you that it, everybody who's walking right now is still in a walkable situation with this recommendation. Next slide, please. So a three-year phased boundary implementation is proposed in coordination with the anticipated opening dates for the new Northeast and Red House Run elementary schools. The new Northeast elementary school will open in August of 2022. A majority of the impacted students will transition at this time, and the impacted schools are shown in green on this chart and map. The completion of Red House Run elementary is anticipated in January 2024. At, time, at that time, existing Red House Run students currently housed at the Rosedale Center will move to the newly constructed school as shown in yellow on this map. And lastly, phase three will occur in August 2024. At this time, the remaining boundary changes will be implemented shown in orange. This includes students residing in the current Elmwood Satellite Area to Red House Run in a neighborhood from Shady Spring Elementary to Elmwood. These students will remain at Elmwood and Shady Spring Elementary Schools through June 2024 and then begin the 2024-2025 school year to avoid any mid-year transitions for these two groups of students. Information on the implementation plan will be shared once the boundary plan is approved by the Board of Education and communication will commence to principal, staff, and families in spring of 2022. Next slide, please. With respect to next steps, the board will host a public hearing on the proposed boundary recommendation, a virtual uh, boundary recommendation hearing on February 16th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. to gather additional public comment. The Board of Education is then scheduled to vote on the boundary for the new Northeast Elementary School at its March 8th, 2022 meeting. Also, the naming recommendation and process for the school will be presented later this evening with public input on the new names scheduled for the February 22nd, 2022 board meeting and subsequent vote by the board on March 8th, 2022. I'd like to take this opportunity to recognize and thank all of our committee members, especially our principals who assisted in facilitating and leading their respective school boundary committees through this process. And if you'll indulge me for a moment, by name, Mr. Jeff Hogan at Elmwood Elementary School, Ms. Candace Winterson from Fullerton Elementary, Laton Ms. Latanya Belser from Joppa View Elementary, Mr. Lori Cortesis from McCormick Elementary, Mr. Kevin Jennings from the New Northeast Elementary, Ms. Missy Thompson from Perry Hall Elementary School, Mr. John Noonan, Shady Spring Elementary School, Mr. Steve Bender from Vincent Farm Elementary School, and Ms. Leah Scarefile from Red House Run Elementary School. Next slide, please. And that concludes our presentation recommendation for the new boundary, or for the boundary for the new Northeast Elementary School. Thank you. Thank you very much. Board members, questions? Yeah. Dr. Hager. I don't want to ask a question because I'm so tired, <laughs> but, um, but I do have a question. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my family was redistricted, so I've lived through this as a, as a parent with children. And I get the idea of minimizing impact as a, as a good thing and, and a big picture idea, but that also means only a handful of kids get moved around. And, and that, you know, you may end up having one child get, you know, moved from third grade of one school to another. So is that really the best practice is, is to kind of minimize it like that? And I'm looking at Shady Springs Elementary School where only 16 kids will move and it'll still be at 97% capacity. That, that just seems like an odd, and you guys are the experts, I'm just, I'm just asking. Yes, we do. We are mindful of in those, those impact tables you see, we are counting how many students are moved from one school to another. And we are mindful of small numbers. We want to try to avoid small numbers of students moving from one school to another. Um, but with that said, we do have to look at um, a lot of the other factors. And so it's something that we do examine and we try to, to, to minimize. But then there are other times where um, it's not avoidable uh, in, as, as it relates to the big picture of all the factors that we're looking at. And, and there was a very generous grandfathering policy in effect when my children were redistricted where 
um, if you had a sibling, you could stay. And the, is that is that the case across the board of Baltimore County? Yeah, that, that makes it stays. even worse. Then you get like one kid redistricting. Right, so rising, <laughs> rising really fourth totally and fifth right. graders will be able to stay yeah. in their siblings. Yeah, um, and then are, are so are, will children transfer to the one new school in January when it's built? Is that what you were saying according to that schedule? So in the mid-year phases, right? So in January twenty, so Red House Run opens in January two thousand twenty-four. So all the current Red House Run students who are at the old Rosedale Center will move in, in January, January two thousand twenty-four. Okay. The third phase covers Elmwood, a small pocket of Elmwood elementary students and Shady Spring okay. elementary students. The committee felt, and we didn't feel that moving those students in January and pulling them out of Elmwood and Shady Spring would be in their best interest. Okay. To just let them finish with mm -hmm. their friends and their community at their current schools, Elmwood and Shady Spring, and then they would move over to the new, um, their new schools. Okay. The Just clarifying year. that, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roberts and uh, Mr. Dixit. So my question is, and I, um, Honeygo Elementary and Chapel Hill mm -hmm. Elementary Schools were not included because they just went through a redistricting. Wasn't Perry Hall Elementary School part of the redistricting for Honeygo and Chapel Hill as well? But they're included in this. Question number two is, um, you talked about keeping natural boundaries and highways, and yet you have it, a Northeast Elementary crossing 95, and you could have easily extended Shady Springs up. And I know I'm asking a lot of questions. Number three is the diversity index. It doesn't change significantly. And my kids attend Honeygo and Chapel Hill, and I've seen the diversity there. I think it's around 40%. Uh, and I read a recent study by the Urban Institute that stated segregation and race, ethnicity, especially for brown and black children, endorsed through persistent r policies. And I see that here because I live here, so I'm speaking on first-hand experience. What kind of diversity um, index was used? And I understand Honeygo was not used because it was recently redistricted, but you use Perry Hall Elementary School which I reckon is a large farm po population. That's why it was used. And I'm actually speaking because I wasn't in part of that study anyways, but what can you speak to that about keeping, making our schools more diverse? And it's not because Chapel Hill and Onigo, where my kids go, it's not as diverse as you come down to Vincent Farms or right. um, Joppa View even, which is literally a mile down from where I live. Right. So I can, I, I can address the first question, Ms. Joes, which may address part of the third question around equity. And certainly, first, I want to mention that we did have staff from the Office of Equity and Cultural Proficiency as well, um, and, and I neglected to include them in the list of cross-divisional staff. So they were there. Mr. Lewis was there, um, who was the East Zone um, OCP representative. That being said, going back to Honeygo, when the Honeygo boundary was done, the community, the Perry Hall Elementary community, the Joppa View Elementary community, as well as really even Chapel Hill, they, they knew this school was coming. So we were very forthright with the Honeygo community in that boundary study to say, this school will be coming online in X years down the road. I think it was 2017, 18, when we were doing the Honeygo boundary. So when we looked at the planning blocks, or not we, but the committee looked at the planning blocks for Honeygo, they knew and anticipated knowing where the new Northeast was gonna go, that there were certain planning blocks that they weren't going to. So they didn't wanna to touch the same students twice. So when the committee, specifically from Perry Hall and the schools that you mentioned, there were sections within those feeder patterns that the committee w didn't look at because they knew they were going to be wrapped into Perry Hall. So with Honeygo, we didn't, Perry Hall Elementary specifically, didn't see a whole lot of relief as well as Joppa View because they knew the, nor the new Northeast was coming, which was more over to the east side, to the White Marsh area where it is. So that, that could address the first part of your question, but also a little bit of your third part because those planning blocks were left because for this school, and those were the schools, and those were the planning blocks that would ultimately be impacted that you see here. So there were not, not a lot of parents that also participated. I saw only 33 or 16 parents from each school. Mm -hmm. But didn't Joppa View and Perry Hall go through two boundary studies because of Honeygo in the past three years, correct? So, so how is it correct. fair to those children that they went through two boundary processes, but you eliminated Honeygo and Chapel Hill? Uh, from and, and and I shouldn't s complain because that's my schools, but I'm also going to talk and some of it may be beyond this board's purview because racial segregation has existed in this country beyond and s it it has to be addressed and I'm might be the only one addressing it, but I'm going to address it because I feel comfortable since my kids go there and I'm going to call out uh, what I see is um, 
segregation. And it's happening because we have policies that have been in place for hundreds of years that help perpetuate this um, racial divide and also economically disadvantaged kids that I see that are all, all down south and we have to uh, do something as a board. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Joes. Um, I have a few questions. Good evening, and thank you for the presentation. I really do appreciate it. This is one process I just think is exceptional, so I just have to give you all the praise in the world. I think you do a fabulous job with this each time, and I always reassure the communities, um, and this is my community, that each time you go through it, but it doesn't matter where it is, that, that Cropper just does a fantastic job with this. So thank you, and I applaud the job you've done, and I think that the testament to that is, is speaks here with the, the community and the fact that you got it done within five meetings and didn't need the sixth is, just speaks to that, so thank you. Um, the questions I have, I have a few questions um, about that. One has to do with the fifth meeting voting. Um, can you speak to the representation of the, the members that voted? You said that there was a quorum at that that voted on the final recommendation. Do you know offhand if there was a representation of all schools that were participating in that quorum that voted on the final? To my understanding, there was. We'd have to go back and look specifically at the minutes to see which schools were. My understanding was every school was, unless Paul, it's, yeah, they weren't. Each school had representation there, but we knew we were missing 18 out of 25, about six members. Okay. Or were there any concerns about the, the final outcome in terms of I didn't attend, you, you didn't no. hold the sixth meeting, so my, my voice wasn't. No, right, so as Mr. Reflected. Cropper mentioned, we, they knew ahead of time, so the, the fourth meeting, mm -hmm. as Mr. Cropper mentioned, they were given that heads up, and they actually discussed it among themselves around we are pretty confident, we don't anticipate major changes coming to the fifth meeting, let alone the sixth meeting. So all those folks who were there on the fourth knew that come December 1st, they were gonna have that, that potential opportunity to vote so no, and subsequent other vote, there were no emails or n no communication that we received with any questions around that. Okay, terrific. Mm -hmm. Well, it's been very quiet on my end, and, and that's always a, a good sign that, that folks are pretty happy, those that have been involved. Um, there have been plenty of opportunities for, for public input, as there always are, which is fantastic. Um, the one concern, and this was literally one concern that was raised, so I, I'm gonna ask about it because I'm curious to know, um, was from a family that that said their final assignment, um, there were school, three schools closer, and I know in Perry Hall the schools are so mm -hmm. um, close in proximity that, that that wasn't hard to believe, but is that something that's reasonable to, to expect because of the proximity of the schools that you could see that that, um, that could I, be a likely outcome, and, and how would you respond to? I would have to, I would have to, to know more of where they were where they're living in terms of to give a good understanding of if they're if they were th three schools closer to where they're being assigned i know that there are limitations to the number of seats in certain schools as we work to draw the lines and uh we certainly try to provide uh get get kids as close to their home close to their home as possible um and and so and i know that there's a lot of uh you know density differences in density of communities versus where the schools are. And so um, I would just, I would have to, if I'd have to know a little bit more on where they were coming from to get an understanding more of the basis on why that may be the case if that was the case. But it was something that was studied heavily to try to um, get you know, students as close to their home as possible. And it was discussed heavily at all of the meetings uh, by the committee members. Sure. Um, also, you, you mentioned, and I noticed in the, the that's time, so I'll, maybe I can email my, my remaining questions. Thank you. Other board members, uh, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Ms. Sen. Uh, thank you for this presentation, for the dedication and the involvement in the committee. Um, going back to something that Ms. Joes mentioned about the diversity and ensuring that our schools are diverse. Uh, slide nine, it says you maintaining or increasing the diversity among schools to reflect the diversity of the region and the school system. So besides having the equity office kind of being a part of the curriculum discussions, what other factors were put into place to ensure that these schools are diverse, that we're being equitable in distribution of so students? One thing I can offer, Mr. Thompson, and someone else can certainly um, chime in as well, was the equity data was in front of the committee from day one. So 
if you look back at the minutes at the videos of the meetings, what you'll see on the periphery of the cafeteria at Middle River were all the maps and all the data. Every meeting they received a packet of about two dozen to three dozen pages of information, of charts, of data maps, of heat maps. Inclusive of that were equity data points, um, demographic data points. So what you would hear when you go around the discussion of what our teams heard going around were conversations and questions similar to what Ms. Joe's offered, what you're offering, in terms of we move this planning block, how is that going to impact? I can remember one specific meeting where they would ask Mr. Cropper, they would ask his assistant or his team members, how would this impact whether, whatever the demographic they were looking at or discussing? And because this was made up of parents, PTA members, of principals, the principals were a great resource in being able to discuss the demographics of not only their school, but particularly of their region. We were fortunate in this boundary study where many of the principals were veteran principals to this area and to their schools, in some cases over 10 years. So they had a lot of history and be able to really digest and, and support their committee and the committee at whole around a lot of the questions they were having around equity to make sure that there was balance. So the short answer is much data was put in front of them to ask, and then the resources were provided to them to help unpack the questions that they had. Okay, so were they like constantly, you know, told to look with an equity lens on these issues? Was it a constant push? Okay, thank you. Um, I, when I was looking at the members of the committee, I'm wondering, why weren't some of the high school students from high school, these high schools that are feeder schools into the Perry Hall High School, these areas, involved in that process? They could have been non-voting members but why didn't we have students involved in this process since they were the ones who were in those schools um, and it kind of have kind of tested their experiences in those schools and the, and the overcrowding in those schools? So one way I would answer that is, as Mr. Cropper mentioned, this is really focused on elementary. So we weren't focused on the feeder pattern to middle or high school. So when we focus on an elementary boundaries change or boundary process, then the focus is on the elementary students. Um, so. It, was, it isn't a natural extension to invite high school students, but certainly something that moving forward, um, certainly something I think the okay, I, good based on policy and rule. Yeah, I just, I think we should be including more students in the process of, of boundary re, um, re, re, reorganizing. Um, and I, I especially, you know, I recently did a project in my AP literature class about redlining and the impacts it has on school boundaries. So I just, I, I'd hope that there would be more student representation along with the parents and the other adults in the room. Uh, but thank you for your explanation of, of how, you know, the equity lens was applied in the curriculum as well. Thank you. Mrs. Causey? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and again, to uh, Mr. Roberts and Mr. Hines. Microphone. Where's the marshmallow people? Come on. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Roberts. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Crawford, Mr. Dixit, Dr. Taylor. Um, so um, I appreciate all the work that's gone into it. We've seen this um, process multiple times, which is um, for the majority, the vast majority, a very beneficial process because we are talking about students going from crowded scenarios into newer schools, brand new schools, and or having their own school at a reasonable capacity. Um, so I appreciate that. Now, I did also um, have a question about that fifth meeting and not the sixth meeting. Did you see there's 33 members of the committee, but 10 are teachers that couldn't vote? Principals. Principals, principals aren't allowed to vote, right. So okay. there are 25, 33, princ 33 total members minus the eight principals, so 25 voting members. And okay. that's inclusive also of Ms. Stith, who is the chair of uh, the board's Northeast Advisory Council. Okay, great. And so there haven't been um, commentary or feedback that anyone disgruntled about the process? No. Okay, that's great. And I do know that the policy 1280 has uh, the scenarios where we are trying to improve every aspect of the program of education, opportunities, um, and to um, support diversity and inclusion and really just try and make the situation as best we can for all of the students and their families. Um, I did have a question related to taking into consideration any future developments that are in that area, it just seems like a whack-a-mole, you know, build a new school and the next one's overcrowded. So I'm just curious how that factored into the uh, planning blocks and, and the decisions that were made. 
Matt, you want to take that? Sure. We, we, we did map out and uh, identify future developments or on existing and planned developments to give them an understanding of where they are and what's in the pipeline and things like that. And, um, and so it was discussed by them. And we always tell them to try to be proactive if, if you can. Um, and if you can give a school a little more space to be able to grow into no, more development, do so. But, um, uh, you know, and they did do that as best as they could, uh, you know, without, without not giving another school as, as much relief as they needed. So even with the new schools online, you're still running uh, close to, you know, 100 percent. This district uh, works very conservatively in terms of your space. And, uh, and so, you know, you're starting at 115 percent over capacity with the new capacity online it brought you down below 100 but so we didn't have a whole lot of wiggle room to give a school a lot of space for to enable new growth and that and that growth was scattered about too it wasn't all concentrated in one school so you know they they looked at it and uh and discussed it as they worked through it thank you and can you unpack uh conservative with the space your comment um well, yeah, as we, we work with districts all across the country and, um, you know, and, and I deal with a lot of school districts that have a lot of excess space. Um, and Baltimore County is not one of them. Not Baltimore County is one of those uh, districts that, that uh, you know, is, is operating around 100% utilization, striving to be around 100% utilization. You have a very old uh, school stock that you're working with in, the, in this county and schools are smaller and uh, you know, a lot of schools are more over 100% utilized. In most studies that we come in and do here, most of your schools are over, well over 100% when we go in and do a boundary change study. And so that's what I was referring to. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, it, in December, the board voted to add to our legislative priorities uh, the local consideration for continued work on the implementation of the adequate public facilities ordinance. Um, was that brought up in any of the boundary studies in terms of what the future of overcrowding would be? I don't think, Ms. Crosby, any more than what Mr. Cropper just mentioned. So there were questions around, particularly from some schools that had questions around new development. So that was really the extent. I don't remember having any recollection of anyone specifically mentioning that study. It was more just related to what Mr. Cropper mentioned. Thank you. Hmm? Thank you. Any other questions, board members? Okay, hearing none. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. I'm staying here. The next item on the agenda is the report on the name of the new Northeast Area Elementary School, and for that, I call on Dr. Roberts. Great. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Uh, we'll bring up that. There it is. So good evening again, Chair Han, Vice Chair Pastor, and Superintendent Williams, and members of the Board of Education. This evening I bring forward for your consideration the community recommendation for the naming of the new Northeast Elementary School. As part of the $1.3 billion capital plan, Schools for Our Future, BCPS is scheduled to open its newest elementary school in the Northeast area. This new school will add 725 seats to the area to support increased student capacity and relieve overcrowding in the area. Next slide, please. The naming of the school moves us one step closer to the opening in August 2022, and in accordance with Board of Education Policy and Rule 7520, an initial survey was issued to the community in December 2021 for the purpose of receiving suggestions for the name of the new Northeast Elementary School. Notification of this survey was communicated via press release and placement on the BCPS and school websites for the duration of the survey window with the top two names moving forward for a second community review or survey in January 2022. Uh, criteria included for the naming of the school for the community's reference, that the name should reflect a subdivision or street on which the school is located, or a geographic location of the school, or a significant or distinguishable landmark, or lastly, a deceased prominent person who has made an outstanding contribution of service to Baltimore County, the state of Maryland, or the United States. Next slide, please. 
So from this initial survey, 419 votes were recorded from the community with two names identified as the most popular, Rossville Elementary School with 95 votes or 21.4% of the votes and Gum Spring Elementary School with 93 or 20.9% of the votes. The remaining 231 votes or 57.7% of the votes were cast for other names that may or may not have met the criteria outlined in policy 7520. Next slide, please. The final survey was issued to the community in January 2022 to solicit input on the final two school names. Again, notification of this survey was communicated via press release and placement on the BCPS and school websites for the duration of the January survey window. For the second survey, 3,483 total votes were recorded. The results of the final community survey were Rossville Elementary School receiving 2,360 or 67.8% of the community votes and Gum Spring Elementary School receiving 1,123 or 32.2% of the community votes. Based on these votes, we are formally recommending Rossville Elementary School as the permanent name of the new Northeast Elementary School. Next slide, please. This is the first reading for the naming of the new Northeast Elementary School or potentially Rossville Elementary School. Public comment for the proposed naming of the new school is scheduled for February 22nd, 2022 with a vote by the full board scheduled for March 8th, 2022, the same day for the boundary study vote. So that concludes the recommendation and presentation for the naming of the new Northeast or Rossville Elementary School. Great. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Board members, any questions? Okay. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. The next item on the agenda is information, which includes the Southeast Area Education Advisory Council meeting minutes from November 25th, 2021. The next item is legislative and governmental relations committee update. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm asking please that you accept the recommendation of the committee on the um, bill that I am about to put forward to you. We have Senate Bill 55, which is the retention of counsel, Senator Sidnor's that we will have the right to select our own counsel. We were in support of that. So SB 55, the committee brings to you this uh, with our support. The next one was Senate Bill 95, which is House Bill as well, House Bill 154. We were in support of it. It is about food allergies, anaphylactic causative agents, that in other words, that schools will, uh, it's a guide for recognizing and disclosing uh, foods that are to be served in schools uh, pertaining to major allergies, making sure that there are at least two people in each school who are perfectly equipped to recognize seizures as well. So we were in support of that. House Bill 347, which is a bill proposing an elected superintendent. We were unanimous in our opposition of that. And then House Bill 470, uh, 476. Um, and that one goes to what is on our priorities that uh, Dr. Hager brought up. Uh, Senate uh, Delegate Eversall is aware that there's a lot that goes into that and a lot of thinking, but it is primarily about trying to stagger uh, our board participation, if you will, that um, ultimately um, the, those who are, are appointed, I can't talk anymore, those who are appointed will be appointed during presidential years and those who are elected as now during the gubernatorial. We were also in support of that. Again, that needs uh, some technical and legal work to make that happen, but we did support it. And all of these are 
moving through um, the legislature. So I don't want us to vote on those. There's another one, but I need to say something else because we brought it to the board or we're bringing it to the board without a recommendation, but I need to say something about it. So I move that the board follow the recommendations of the committee for Senate Bill 55, Senate Bill 95, House Bill 347, and House Bill 476. No second is needed because it's coming from the committee. Ms. Pester, may we separate House Bill 476? Sure. Thank you. Okay, then let's take a vote and on- we have a roll call. Any discussion? Mrs. Causey? Uh, thank you. Um, I was in the committee and I just wanted to separate the bill about the um, Eversols and Forbes. That's, that's the one I separated. separated. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Joes? Could you clarify what that bill is you just separated? You keep saying Eversol, that's all I hear. It's the one that I just described that it is about the um, staggering of the board members. And if I may speak to my separation. Sure. Um, I, it sounds like it needs work, so I j simply separated it because it needs work. So I'll be supporting the other bills for the committee's recommendation. Dr. Hager? I'm just trying to look at the food allergies bill. It's not, it's not creating peanut-free schools. It's just creating guidance on, on allergies. Correct. Correct. I, I, right. Not, not for peanut-free schools, but right. for. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you. Yeah, it goes beyond peanuts. Um, for as I, it might have been Miss Rowe, someone pointed out that um, because we're feeding all of the children now, that we don't know, uh, as we used to be able to gather, what the allergies are. So making sure that that information uh, is is public, so that. Uh, we know how to recognize it. We have people who can recognize and that we are um, disclosing what it is that is going on in the school so we can better safeguard our children. Okay. Thank you. Any further discussion? Could you Mrs. just restate the policy numbers and titles? Sure. Vote? Senate Bill 55, that's the retention of counsel. Senate Bill 95, which has a companion, House Bill 154, that is food allergies, House Bill 347, uh, which is having an elected superintendent. And that was opposed. Mr. Thomas? Yeah, just to clarify, the first two were in support. The elected superintendent was in opposition. The first yes. two were for support of and we were unanimous in opposition on the one about the elected superintendent. Thank you. Okay. Okay. May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Ms. Scott? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Uh, now the... Okay, the one that was separated is House Bill 476. That again is the one that discusses uh, how we separate the election or the um, participation of board members, those who are appointed and those who are elected. There, do you want to make a motion, Ms. Pester? Okay. Or ask for a motion? Well, the motion coming from the committee was to support it with, um, of course, there will be amendments because he is still working on it, but he is going to put it forward anyway. In fact, it's going forward. So um, there are a number of things he's doing. So the option, he, the notion here is that we offer our support or not 
uh, as he moves forward. So that is the motion to support. And who is making that motion, Mr. Thomas, for you? We need a motion if, yes. if we're di before we discuss it. I'll make a motion. Okay, Dr. Hager, no second is needed since it comes from the committee. Um, Mr. Thomas and then Mrs. Quasi. Thank you. So I've spoken to Delegate Eversall about this bill, and it doesn't, in its direct language right now, address the staggering for the appointed members. Ms. Pesho alluded to that. Ms. Henny alluded to that as well. So I think that we, I, I'd like to amend this motion to add with an amendment that relates to the staggering of the appointed members and for this next year. Oh, could you clarify? Yeah. Yes, I can. You just stated. Sure. So the the motion is to say what um, Dr. Hager's legislative priority was in in in, the, in my motion to support this. So we support it with an amendment. Support this bill with an amendment that would require the next appointed set of individuals to be two years, and then after that, going back to the cycle of four years for appointed members, so that we have in one election our appointed members coming in, and in the other election our elected members coming in. Does that make sense? So does the, does the bill not stipulate that now? Is that your understanding? In, it does not stipulate that now in the direct wording of the bill. It, 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 does. it does? Yes, I worked okay. with him on Saturday. His bill does talk about the first go round being the two years. That, that's his, the history. That's what undergirds it all. It would be that because that's the only way it would work. Right. Um, and it is about separation. It's not just about keeping from having a lame duck, it, that it, inclu it includes that, keeping from having a lame duck governor uh, making the appointments of those who are the appointments. Um, and that's what he has to fine tune. He's trying to fine tune how you do that because there are a number of obstacles in the way called law that some of the things that have to be changed in order to do this. But his bill is about being able to stagger, to, to eliminate, it, it's two parts, to eliminate this governor or any lame duck governor from being able to select the people. And then how do we stagger it? And he wants it all to happen at the same time. It's not one and then the other. So you're correct in that his language needs to be greatly fine tuned because it involves a lot of legalese. And until he gets that, he can't really put all of that out okay. there like that. So you are Thank correct you. in that. But I just want to make it clear that this is his intent. Okay. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Ms. Pestjor, for all the work that you do uh, around the legislation and um, the committee's work. Um, I had concerns about the language in the bill related to the uh, start time of the elected members and then the appointed members. So I think it might be easier if we have it a motion to amend, to, to <clears throat> excuse me, support with amendments to be brought back to this board by the legislative committee. Because I think it, as Ms. Pesture points out, it, it takes a lot of work and we're not gonna be able to do that this evening. And that's not our job anyway, but um, it, Let me something to throw out and consider. Well, Especially since we don't have a motion that. in the chat. Okay, well, let me throw that out because at the committee meeting, all of you voted for it. I'm the one that didn't vote for it for those same reasons. So we, at that point, should have been thoughtful enough to process what I was saying to you at that meeting. So here we go. So we can have that motion tonight. Let's go. So, so there's a motion on the floor and a motion to amend restate your motion well can the Mrs. original Cozy motion delay. be stated and then i'll formalize an amendment you may so um, dr hager what, what's, what's the goal <laughs> i've lost it's no, late I'm, I'm gonna, to go home to go home mr well, Mercedes. Mercedes. you got that right i'm the, the goal is to support with amendment it sounds like the bill No, he's he's got a lot of work to do. So what, can we postpone this next? It needs to be postponed. Yeah. April. April. We have time. April. Yeah. He has to clean. There are a lot of trust me when I say 
Somebody trust me here. So if we were to postpone. There's a lot of work he has to do that because there's some legal things that need to be massaged before he finishes with it. He's putting it out now because he wants everyone, he wants to, folks to see where he's going. But he has a lot of work. He understands that. He knows that, that he has a lot of work yet to do. So. Okay. So, Dr. Hetier, would you w be willing to withdraw your motion? Instead, okay. So, why don't you <laughs> go ahead and if there's a motion you'd like to make uh, to instead postpone. to postpone. Next sure. I'd move to postpone it to the next meeting. Do I have to do that or can we just do that? Second row. Okay. Why don't you just state it for the record? I move to postpone the discussion of HB 476 to our next meeting. Great. Second row. Okay. Thank you. Any discussion? Hearing none. Roll call vote. Ms. Please. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Kazi? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. I'm sorry. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Q? Yes. Ben. Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. The last item on the agenda is a minute. I had, oh, I'm sorry. had the other, there was one more. One it was more. it was um, Senate Bill 124, which is Senator Hattleman's. We brought it without a recommendation, but the members of the committee tasked me with getting additional information from her. I sent it all to you. Um, I apologize. It was late, but she sent it to me late because I did ask to have it for today. So I'm going to make a motion that, so you have a chance to read it, read the information. I'm going to make a motion that we postpone any discussion and any vote of this bill until the next meeting. Second, Second row. Thank you. Any discussion? May we have a roll call vote, please? On the motion to table. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Anything else, Ms. Pester? No. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now the last item on the agenda is announcements. The board will hold its public hearing on the new Northeast Area Elementary School boundary on Wednesday, February 16th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. The meeting will be held virtually and pre-registration will be required to sign up to speak. More information may be found on the board's participation by the, public web, by the public website or in board docs in this agenda item. The board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, February 22nd, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. Thank you for joining us tonight. The meeting is Wait, now adjourned. Before we go, I really do need us to applaud Dr. Williams and staff at Strong Schools Maryland. We were the only school system that has a mighty awesome blueprint for Maryland's future. When you open it, look at it. If you haven't seen it, it's fabulous. Strong Schools Maryland sent out to all of the counties an, an announcement to look at Baltimore County's website and model it. 